Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Kelsey, thanks so much for making the time to come all the way to Austin. I really appreciate it. Although I'm not going to take credit for the fact that you came here for this. I think this was uh, an opportunistic time to sit down. For sure. I mean, I, I definitely did come here for this and there are some other great people here that um, I get to visit. It's perfect. So thank you for having me. Yeah. I know my wife is really upset that you don't live here. You know, it's funny because I went out with them last night and there's this draw to this place because there's a lot of good people here. And I think during COVID, I, I understood why everybody was leaving and I really couldn't stand LA. And there was just a thousand reasons the past couple of years have been hard, but all of a sudden, suddenly I really love LA again. So I'm going to hold on and vis just visit you guys every month. Very well. That's the plan. So where'd you grow up? I grew up in Winter Park, Florida. Got it. Okay. And when did you start swimming? I was probably four and I probably raced in my first race at six. Wow. So when did you realize you were a good enough swimmer to be a collegiate swimmer? You know, it's funny. We talk about this with sports and kids these days. It just wasn't on our radar the way it is for kids now. Um, I lived in Florida. You wanted to be outside. You wanted to be with your friends. So we swam. And uh, little by little, I, you know, I'd win a few races, 25 butterfly, something on backstroke. And it was just something fun to do with your friends. So I don't even remember thinking about college until maybe ninth grade when I won. I, I think we got second at state. And then my sophomore year, I won state. And In what event? 100 back and 100 fly. Mm. Um, Did and you swim IM as well? I didn't. I was terrible at breaststroke. Okay. Horrible. There's a bunch of jokes about that we could go into, but I won't right now. Yeah, I, don't, I remember thinking like, oh, well, that's great. Like I just won Florida's you know, state championships. But I also remember just loving my team and that like Winter Park High School won and at that point, you really didn't talk to coaches. You didn't know recruiting, especially female athletes. It wasn't huge back then to get this a scholarship. This was pre-Title IX. I or what? I'm trying to think. I've got to look that up because I, I mess that fact up all the time. I feel like there weren't a lot of people I'd ever met that had a scholarship that were girls. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't until maybe my junior year that my coach said, you know, a couple coaches have called and said that, you know, you could get a scholarship. And my family wasn't into sports. They just didn't even, I mean, they came to my swim meets, but not really a lot of, um, they just weren't, everybody did their own thing in our family. It was not how parents are now that are driving their kids and doing special coaches and meets and stuff like that. So all I remember, it was just, I had a lot of energy to burn off and swimming was the one thing that after I was done, I felt like I burned that jet fuel off. That's all I remember really. And then it just got better. And then coaches started to talk to me. Um, and then the rest is kind of history. So what do you remember about getting to uh, UNC you went Chapel to, Hall. right? Obviously, yeah. So, so I remember I went to, to a basketball game with one of my girlfriends whose dad had gone there. Maybe this was my junior year. And long story short, but he, his, her brother dated the swim coach's daughter. And so at the basketball game, which is huge in Chapel Hill, it might have been a Duke Carolina game. I don't know. But I remember it was a big deal. And someone said, oh, Carolina's impossible to get in out of state. And I thought, well, then I'm definitely going to try to get in out of state. Um, and so I, I met the swim coach and he said, you know, call me when you're the end of your junior year, when you're a senior. And I tried to get in. I don't think I got into Carolina at first. And they had already given a scholarship to a girl from Ohio. She was going to swim 200 backstroke, 100 backstroke. So I got an offer for Miami, FSU, and I think Florida. But I, I wanted to get out of Florida so badly because everybody I knew was going there. And I was like, I want to have a new experience. And so I just held. And then that spring, the girl uh, decided to go somewhere else. And so they gave me did a- Did you turn down those other scholarships? I did. Wow. I did. They were in-state schools and I, I, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to go there. And if I, I was, I didn't want to swim. Mm -hmm. It was all, because we were swimming against all the same people I grew up with. I just knew I needed a new experience. And I was kind of set on Chapel Hill. And somewhere deep in my soul, I knew it would work out, which I have no idea why or how. And I remember coming home and we had answer machines then. And I hit my answer machine and it was Coach Frank Comfort. And he was like, girl, we got a spot for you. We'll give you a partial scholarship. And if you make NC2As, we'll give you a full. And so I spent the first two years with just tuition. And then my parents paid room and board. And then once you made NC2As, you got a full scholarship. So my junior and senior year. So you swam fly and back. Yep. Both distances. Hundred back, two hundred back, hundred fly. 
Those are, were my three. Yeah. Didn't want to do the 200 fly. God, my arms would like kill myself. <laughs> I wanted to, every, that third 50, I'd just be like, why am I doing this? What it did you a, swim? It is a brutal race. What'd you swim? Well, I, I just swim like long distance swimming, like ultra distance swimming. Of course. You but do. when I swim in the pool, I, the only thing I could swim was breaststroke. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I, I was decent breaststroker. Right. But horrible. I couldn't swim backstroke if my life depended on it. Isn't that funny? And okay at butterfly. So short axis strokes were fine. Pretty bad freestyler, despite the fact that I could swim it for a long period of time, but not fast. Right. right. <laughs> so, Interesting. Uh, but I loved IM. That's why you, I, I bet you would have been a decent IM or even if your breaststroke wasn't. No, I would, I would burn it out. Butterfly. You, you didn't backstroke, have anything left for free. And then free. they would just pass me. I, I, had, I had something left for free, but I wasn't good. I just, I wasn't, I wasn't. Yeah, as I guess good that's as true. I, I think with IM, I think having a strong breaststroke is valuable because it's late in the race yep. and everybody's tired and it takes up the most time of the race. So if you can, I remember swimming like at a master's meet, if I could take six seconds out of somebody in a uh, breaststroke, right. they could be faster than me in the other, they, nobody's going to take anything out of you in the fly because it's the beginning of the race. Right. Like you just, everybody's sort of conserving energy. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a fair point. But what year did you matriculate? I graduated from high school in 95 okay. and Chapel Hill in 99. Okay. So what year did you meet Nate? So I met Nate in 1998. So the summer. So you were kind of a junior. I was going then? into my junior year. Okay. I think I, and I, I met him the summer of 1998 and I had just finished my sophomore year swimming and I was just kind of a hot mess. I'd gained a ton of weight. I ate like cream cheese and croissant sandwiches because we were had like, um, what's it called? Training table. I just really let it fly with penny draft and just nights out, just my face and my body was just not, not primed for winning anything. <laughs> um, I started dating a guy who had a, a weed problem and, you know, I kind of dabbled in that very little, but I, I was, I was running with a crowd that wasn't conducive to being excellent. Well, so you didn't hang with most of the swimmers? I did. He was on the swim team. Oh, he was on the swim team. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I, I would assume the swimmers would date a lot each other because you have the same schedules and yeah. training. And, yeah. and at Caroline at the time, you couldn't rush a sorority or fraternity if you were on a swim, if you were on an athletic team. So basically they had you, that was your group. Um, so I was really kind of insular with the swim team. I, I didn't love it so much as I did in high school. I didn't love that I felt like my that my scholarship was depending on it, that all of my friends did the same thing. Because in high school, we all had 12 girlfriends, but everybody was different. I was the swimmer. One was the nerd. One was the smart one. One was the party one. And once I got to Chapel Hill, we were all fighting for NT2As or for the spot on the relay. So it was just a different experience. So I dated this guy for a while, and then my summer before my junior year, I met Nate at a bar. And had, was Nate a senior at that point? He was had going he, into his fifth year senior Yeah, because he redshirted his for yep. a year. Yeah, okay. He was going into his fifth year, and I met him at a bar, and um, I just remember him walking in, and just an absolute enormous man with more confidence than you've ever seen in your life, more swagger for a huge fat guy that you can, I mean, unbelievable. And I met him that night, and he he gave me this napkin that said, if you want the best, say goodbye to the rest. Go home with me and I'll make you happy. And I mean, I was like, what? But the funny part is years later, I met a girl at a wedding and she's like, you won't believe it. I know you're married to Nate Hopgood Shittig, but he left me a napkin one time in college. And I was like, mother of God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I met him that night and then we didn't really, we didn't see each other for a while. Um, it, but it turned out one of my roommates was dating a guy on the offensive line named Ryan. And so a couple months later, we had a house party where we watched X-Files, which is a great thing. And just everybody partied and got drunk and danced and Nate was there. And at some point that night, a guy called that I was dating and Nate just walked over and took the phone and was like, she's with me now. <laughs> and, and, and that was it. Wow. So what is it that you liked about him in that moment? Because on the one hand, it sounds like you were kind of amused, but, but yeah. I mean, what did you see at that moment? I mean, from the minute I met him, if I'm honest, like I knew there was something and he was nothing. I grew up in a, my father's a lawyer. My mom was very politically active, a country club, you know, very kind of rigid, you know, very, lots of, um, my town was very Southern and Christian and um, when I met Nate, he was so different. He was like a poor kid from Allentown, just a, a guy that hustled. And 
I just felt he was different. He was connected. Like when he'd sit and listen to you, you felt like you were the most important person in the world. And he did it with everybody. I could see how he interacted. There was a way when he walked into a room that you could tell everybody loved him and he loved them. Um, so I knew that first night something was different about him. And then the, the night that we kind of started dating, there was just a joy to Nate that was different and an extreme way of living, which was concerning then and concerned me my entire life with him. But he was here for the moment. He was here to have a good time and feel it all, experience it all. Um, most loving human being you'll ever meet, truthfully. So I couldn't understand how I was attracted to him because it just didn't match anything that I had imagined. Um, but when we started talking, the things he was talking about were the same thing as me. Like, what do you want to do with your life? Who do you want to be? What books have you read? Um, what type of spiritual practices do you have? And we were, you know, 19 and 22. And I remember he was on this deep search for meaning and purpose. And how do we serve? How do we get the most out of this life? Um, and so we kind of both started on a spiritual journey at a very young age. And that's what I loved about him always. So married a really fat, 300 pound, amazing defensive tackle. What year did you guys get married? We got married in 2002. We got engaged at the World Trade Center in 2001 in July. So. Yeah, a couple months before 9-11. Right. And at the top of the tower. Right? At the, yep. And I remember Nate being like, do you think that's a good sign or a bad sign? Hmm. And for a long time, I was like, I think it's a good sign. And then after everything happened, I was like, maybe it was a bad sign. <laughs> but um, yeah, we loved living in New York. He played for the Giants. And so we lived there for a while. And then we got married in 2002 in Florida. So... You know, Nate was not the guy who was going to get drafted in the first round. So what was your thinking as you were saying, okay, I'm really serious about this guy. And he wanted to play in the NFL. Like who doesn't play college football and wants to play in the NFL? Right. So what were you thinking about um, his chances? And, you know, obviously he had an amazing work ethic. How far did you think that that was, you know, did you actually think that could get him out of college football? I, I actually can hear him laughing. I, I was like, you'll never make it, which was always what I'd say to him, like the worst. I would be <laughs> like, you don't have a shot in hell. Like you haven't started. And he was like, I'll just work my way. If I can just get a shot. He was always like, if I can just get a shot. And so truthfully, when the draft came, I had never, I'd seen him play in college, but he wasn't a starter. He started. He almost lost his scholarship, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he almost lost it. And uh, Mac Brown was the coach. And he was like, listen, buddy, this isn't going to work for you. Like, yeah, he was just, like fourth on the depth chart or something. Yeah, right? he was behind like Vonnie Holiday and some of the, I can't remember, Dre Bly. It was just a big year at Chapel yeah. Hill. We'd beat FSU. And I remember just thinking like, it's not going to happen. But we were young and I didn't, you know, I still had a year and a half of school and so I remember he went to the combine and he he had a really fast 40 and he hit, he had a good combine and Caroline had had a great year. So he was back up to some guys that were going first and second round. Um, but truthfully, the day of the draft, I didn't even understand it. And our families, his family too, not into football. My family, not into football. I actually thought it was an archaic sport, both sides, academics on both sides. Um, and Nate was like, if I could just get a chance on a practice squad, then I could make it. And then we could save a little bit of money and then we could maybe buy a house someday. I mean, that was pretty much the way we thought of it. Um, so when he got called by the Giants to be on the practice squad, everybody was shocked, but also knew that there was nobody that made the good guys try harder than a guy like Nate, because he would just literally go until he couldn't. So I think I was surprised and it was more just, we were young. I was like, good luck. Like, I hope you make the team. But we, I wasn't ever that invested in his career. Um, I just wanted him to do it and get out safe and then make some money so that we could start our real life. So did you know Jeff Saturday when they were roommates? Like, you oh, must yeah. Have, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jeff's still one of my best friends and his wife. So we all lived together. Jeff and Nate lived together from freshman year. And... I mean, the story about Jeff is... Yeah, tell that story. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's an amazing story, especially in light of what Jeff Saturday went on to become, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest centers of the game and to think that he got overlooked and, and yeah, so yeah. tell people how that happened. So Jeff and Nate were roommates freshman year and Jeff tells this great story about when he first met Nate, um, he he went to introduce himself, but Nate was sobbing, hugging his parents and he was like, wait, I'm, I'm like going to be rooming with this like crybaby? Like what's happening? Jeff's a guy from Georgia, grew up kind of a rough life, very tough. And they ended up being best friends. They played together along with Chris Keldorf, who was up for the Heisman. There was a group of them. And when we all were waiting for the draft, Chris had been the quarterback and Jeff was the center. And we were certain they were going to go in 
fourth round, fifth round. And we all just sat there and you kind of just sit around back then and just wait for the phone to ring. And there's no cell phones or anything. And nobody called, nobody called, nobody called. And then the only person that got called was Nate. So Nate went on to the Giants and got on the practice squad and barely made it through that first cut, but he made it. And then he got released by the Giants and the Colts picked him up right away. So Nate moved to Indianapolis. And at that time, Jeff was, wasn't sure. He, I think he got a shot at Baltimore on a practice squad, but didn't make it. So he came back to North Carolina and started working at like a pet boys. And they didn't think he had a shot. It was kind of over. He was too short. I mean, Nate used to always tell him, and Jeff, if you're listening, they said, you know, he has short arms. He'll never make it as a center. And they wrote all these awful things about him. And Nate just always went up against him in practice for four years. And he was like, he's the best fucking guy I've ever played against. So at some point, Nate was still barely making the Colts, trying to just get, you know, you want to get paid week by week if you make the team and if you play. So it's not how people think. And so at one point, Nate said he had a really tough practice. And the guys that he played against, he's like, I just walked away being like, those guys aren't even close to what Jeff did. So he walked into Polian's office in like dirty sweats. Polian doesn't even know who he is. He has no clue. He's like, who is this guy? Because he's just like a guy trying to make the team. And he said, there's a guy in Raleigh, North Carolina that's working at an auto parts store right now. His name's Jeff Saturday. And he could kick all those guys' asses that I just played. And... Coach said, well, if you want him to come live with you, I'll give him a shot. And then that was it. And the rest is history. Six Pro Bowls or whatever it is. Super yeah, Bowl. he'll be a Hall of Famer. And I still get mad because Nate and I are like, and he got us a comforter for our wedding. Like, we're like, hey, buddy, like, we kind of <laughs> started your whole career and all we got was like. Oh, we got this lousy comforter. Yeah, it was we're like, like we're looking right? for more. We're yeah, looking yeah. for more. Yeah, just one of the greatest guys, biggest heart, um, and has gone on to have an exceptional career for sure. So let's go back to, let's start at 99, right? So you were the Rams, you're in St. Louis. I remember this year very well yep. because, I mean, Kurt Warner, of course, yes. you know, the whole story. So at the beginning of that playoff run, did you think this is really going to happen? Were you? Yeah, it was really fun. For the first time, I was like, oh, this is fun. And we were winning. Um, I was still in college. So I would fly. Oh, that's right. You This would have been your senior 99. year? Yeah. So yeah. I was still in college and it was it was just fun. And we were winning and we were winning. And Kurt was an exceptional leader spiritually, emotionally, everything. And the team just had a bunch of really good guys on it. And it was fun to be a part of that team. And I think I've always felt like the energy matters the most. And there was something that was telling us the energy on this team is good. So every time they won, you just, now it gets more, you're like, please win, please win. Then you're like, really? Cause you know that this, this may never come again. And most of the time it doesn't. And we had Dick Vermeil as a coach who's still Probably Epic. one of the greatest humans yeah. to me and still continues to come to my house twice a year to see the kids and just have dinner with us. Mm. Just an exceptional advocate for his players as human beings, way past, you know, their football. Um, Nate loved him and he was the one that gave Nate a shot multiple times just because of his character. Because it takes like he's not that good, but he really makes the other good guys better. Um, so that year was just exceptional and it was fun and St. Louis was on fire and that that city needed it. And I remember when we made it to the last, I, I'm the worst about football, the last playoff game, whatever happened last night that we all just yeah, watched. Yeah, the divisional championship. Right. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh my God, we could, we could win the Super Bowl. But I was young. And I, so I got there and I was wearing some like nerd outfit and all the other NFL wives were like smoking hot and looking so cool. And I think I had like my backpack, <laughs> but I just didn't know. We didn't, we weren't into it like that. And I remember the last play came and it was that big play where Mike Jones was tackled. I forget who. I, forget. I don't remember. Anyways, it was that last second. And I remember thinking, and I told Nate this, and he was very offended. I was like, whatever you do, don't put Nate in. <laughs> like, please don't put him in. Because I didn't want him to be the guy that- like, If they missed, lost, you didn't If they lost, him, yeah. I was like, I can't live with it. But they tackled the guy before he got in the end zone, and the Rams won. And it was just exceptional. It was an exceptional experience. And there's, I don't know if you know this, but they have two parties for both the teams. Just one's a lot more fun. They're identical. So each team has no, a I hotel and yeah. each team has the same exact party ready, but one's just yeah. the, the party that's the better that's one. That's right, because they all both have the t-shirts ready as if they're going to use 100%. it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. You're NFC champion or not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I just remember it was fun. We danced. We, we had a great time. We never took any of it for granted. We loved all of it. And Nate was in a ton of pain, always. Yeah, you, you wrote about that a lot in the book. And um, 
it's sort of interesting when you think about how early in his career he was. I mean, he was in pain before he made it to the NFL, which is something that we would assume, well, you know, God, if a guy's been in the NFL for 15 years, I can sort of see why he wouldn't have toes anymore right. and why he wouldn't be able to feel his hands. But you don't think of a guy who's 22 trying to get into the NFL already under that type of discomfort. Yeah, he was banged up because, first of all, he, when you play on the line, that's a whole other ball game. And when you are not a starter that kind of gets to take breaks. So Nate was the workhorse. And so he took so many hits. And when he got to college, I don't, I don't want to mess up the, the weight, but he was skinny, not skinny, but he was a basketball player in high school. And in order to play the position that he was welcome to play at North Carolina, he had to gain a ton of weight. So he, by the time, I think when we got married, he was 300 pounds and maybe he was like 220 when he got to Carolina. So he force fed. So I think the weight he put on his body put all, to, to move that amount of weight around that fast and that often took a toll pretty early. His neck was a 21. Could that be right? Yeah. It was enormous. And I remember the first night I slept with him, not literally, but maybe, I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, I remember being like, this snoring won't work. This will, this is, this is a game changer. Like we're going to have to make a move. And when he got to the giants within a couple of weeks, they gave him a sleep apnea mask at 22. So for the, our entire time together for 21 years, I never have slept with a man that didn't have a sleep apnea mask which is awful to look at, but it has this wonderful white noise sound. And your husband it doesn't snore. It helps him sleep too. And it helps him sleep. And I remember he used to say like, I could die without this. I'm like, no, you couldn't. So early on, I think he was just too big to do what he was doing without paying a price quite often. Um, and he was, but he wasn't a complainer. He's like, I choose this. But you could just tell he spent a lot of time just managing where to put the pain, which was out of his mind and just accepting it's, it's what it is to get us where we want to get to, which again was always save some money and then, then go start the life that I wanted to do to serve people or do whatever. What did you think at the time, not knowing necessarily what you know today, because I think today you have much more perspective on that, but when he was 23, 24 years old, what did you imagine he was going to be like at 50 as a result of the injuries he already had? Like, did you think, did you, did you have a vision in your mind of when we're 60, we're going to be just, we're going to be hiking in Peru, you know, backpacking with our grandkids. Like, did you, did you think that it was all, this was all going to be okay. And these injuries 100%. are going to go away. Well, he was always into health. He was always into, um, learning about his body. He took great care. He had great people, Mike Clark, great, great people that were doing good things, taking care of his body. He was always very well. There's double side to Nate. He was always very aware of what he put in his body and taking care of him through PT and ice baths and all that stuff. But he also loved like wings and beer and partying. So I don't know which is which, but I definitely thought that when he was done, he would lose the weight and he would become hot and skinny and we would live a happy life. I mean, I never thought that, I never thought he would stay so big. And that's kind of a side note. I think when those guys get really big, it's part of it's part of what they love about themselves. There's a respect that they get when they walk into a room. They don't actually want to get that much smaller. Um, one of our best friends, Tony, is, but he was always fit. But he really, and Jack, um, Jeff did too. They both got really skinny. I think Nate secretly loved being big because um, he would lose weight, but he never really loved himself at 235. He loved himself around 260, and I think that was still too much weight. So as the years went by, that would be a fight that we had quite often. Like, when are you going to start? Like, when are you going to start doing what you promised you would do, which was lose all the weight and stop dipping and you know just don't drink as many beers and don't eat chicken wings and nachos. And it just he would have spurts of it, but the Allentown in him just couldn't couldn't be stopped. So you guys married in O2. Married in O2. And then he retired in O2 or O3. He retired um, right before my son was born. So I think 04. Oh, okay. All right. So was that a happy day for you? It was mixed. How it was, so? Um, well, he didn't have a job. Mm. He didn't have a lot of life skills. Emails had just started. We had just started. Technology was not Nate's jam. Um, he lived in a, in this, in a world way up in, way up in the sky. He lived in big dreams and big hopes and I was like, we have a baby on the way. And like, what are you going to do for a living? I was a pharmaceutical sales rep, which was not 
my ideal job, but it was a great job to have coming out of college. I didn't know what he was going to do. And I think a lot of guys, when they transition out of football, most of them only play three to four or five years. You kind of just get dropped into the world again. And all your friends that you went to college with, they've been working for five or six years. And you now are starting at an entry level job, like maybe 40,000 a year. You're used to making that a week. You're used to everyone worshiping you. It's a huge transition. To, for these guys. Yeah, people, uh, it, it's very easy if you're not mindful of it to lose sight of what the median experience is like in the NFL. Right. Right. Not the mean, right? Because the mean gets dragged up by the Tom Brady's, Aaron Rodgers, you know, the guys that have remarkable longevity, remarkable skill, make a remarkable amount of money. But if you talk median, like what's the guy right in the middle, the 50th percentile guy? Yeah, he might be in the league for three years. Maybe. Right? He might have made a million or two over three years before Maybe. taxes, before paying agents, blah, 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 blah. And then the other thing is, what did that do to his life expectancy statistically? Right. Just how many years did he pay for that? Um, and when you look at it that way, you know, it's sort of like any sport, right? I mean, I, I shouldn't say any sport. I think football is one of the worst. Boxing would be another example, right? It's very easy to see the guys at the top of that. But the pyramid that those guys stand on is a base this wide that's getting crushed. Yeah, and I think, and I mean, obviously, last the last four games that we've watched the past two weeks have given me this, this dual experience that I continue to have around football, um, that it is this great unifier and this great community builder and this this wonderful thing that brings people together and brings a bunch of people joy and brings the players a lot of opportunities and a lot of gifts and gives their families a ton of things. And then there's this whole other side that we don't see a ton of, which is the guys that played three years and are still beat up or they don't have any money or they couldn't transition. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to, I, and especially after the past two weekends watching these playoff games, they were so fun. And it, it made you love football and it made you see this is a great thing. And I would never let my kid play. And, you know, I would never have a kid in a helmet. But I don't, I, I used to think I had all the answers about certain things and that I had, you know, a really strong opinion one way or the other. And I'm probably more conflicted about a lot of things in life than I ever was. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, but I feel conflicted about football. And I, I can't speak for Nate because... He's not here, but I would love to hear what he has to say, what his perspective was. Um, I know what his buddy's per perspective is, and I I do think that it's that a lot of them. It's it's a great honor to play that sport, and it's like the you're like the king of 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 what everybody wants to do. You know, you you get this opportunity that kids dream of, but there is a price, and we don't really show that side of it. We don't tell kids like what's that guy doing ten years later. Like we don't do ESPN. Um, spotlights on that right remember when mtv used to always do that <laughs> where are they now where are they now yeah. oh my god <laughs> this was lit. my roommate in med school this was our this is the only thing we would watch on tv <laughs> every single week we would never miss it and what we loved about it was it was always the same story you could just plug in a new name of a band like this week it's motley Crue. right this week's it's guns and roses but guess what it's the same story that's actually an interesting just idea like, where are these people that were so amazing three years ago or five years ago? What do they do now? Where do they live? What is their crib? What does their crib look like today? How are they financially? How's their relationship with their children, with their kids? Um, I have obviously been surrounded by guys like Tony Gonzalez and Jeff Saturday who are exceptional men, husbands, friends. Um, but I know that is not always the case. So I don't know. These discussions have been had at length. Um, the book has brought out uh, very strong opinions on both sides. I'd like to come back to that yeah. because I think, um, I too feel conflicted um, about a lot of this stuff. So what city were you guys living in when Ned retired? So basically when he got released by Kansas city, we went out to visit a friend that lived in Manhattan beach, California. And he said, you got to come to this little town. It's so great. And so we went out there and then while we were there, he got picked back up by, I don't remember what team, maybe the Rams again, Vermeil always grabbed him again when he could. He's a good man. And I said, I'm just going to stay. I'm not going to keep bouncing around. I'm going to get a job because someone's got to get a job. Someone's got to take care of this family. I said, <laughs> he was like, please. So I stayed and he played about another year and a half. 
And then he, his last team was the Cardinals. They gave him a shot, but he was done. I mean, he was emotionally done. You have to really want it. And he was so tired of sitting in the media. There's a lot of sitting in football. There's a lot of film and watching. And Nate was like, after a while, this is just like, this cannot be my life. I can't just be watching like run X and O's. I like he had big dreams to change the world. And so once he got cut, we moved back and we moved into El Segundo pretty quickly after that we got pregnant and he went back. Both of you? Both of us got pregnant. <laughs> Nate, Nate looked pregnant. <laughs> I, I looked really pregnant. So we lived in El Segundo. He went back and got his master's in social work. Yeah. Did that, uh, did that surprise you that, um, I mean, in, in a way I'm sure it didn't because of how much he loved the world and wanted to help people, yeah. but did it surprise you that that was the chosen path? So he comes with his dad was a minister at Harvard and his mom was a professor at Holy Cross. Um, so he comes from an academic kind of service oriented family that was if like some kids are told to be bankers, he was told to serve. Mm. So that was pretty much in his soul. So I don't know. And he didn't have a ton of skill sets. I, I don't. What did he study in college? Like every Everything. good. He North, studied football. No, he studied communications like communications, we all did got it. along with the help of many people. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> that was back in the day. So yeah, we, we didn't, he didn't have any, he didn't, he hadn't had an email. Everything when you're in the NFL. By the way, that reminds me of a funny story. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try not to name names here because it's not Please, fair, just but, make up a student name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so about the, I don't know. I won't even tell what year because then you could figure out who it was. But years ago, a few years ago, um, I was helping out a buddy who wanted me to come and do some work with the kids who were going to be probably the top 10 picks out of college. So. Okay. It, had the potential to be, so meaning they all went in the first two rounds, including Heisman Trophy winner. So there's 10 of us there, <clears throat> the guy who brings me in to help <clears throat> me, and then there's these 10 kids, some of whom are playing right now and are the best in the NFL. Right. And so the guy who had me come in, talk to them, he's like, hey, look, you know, we did some blood work on them. We want to talk about nutrition. We want to talk about, you know, like what can they do to optimize their performance? So he brings me to this conference room. It's beautiful. And it's in Petco Park in San Diego, which is where everyone was meeting. And you know, I'm starting to try to explain like some of the biochemistry, but, I, and I'm keeping it, I'm not, believe me, I'm not going all in on this, right? I'm just doing like, you know, glucose. You know, glucose. Right, 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 guys? That, right? And oh, God. what did the guy say? So one of the guys goes, he's like, so bad. The guy who won the Heisman was like, I don't know, what you, I, don't, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> And one of the other guys, who I think, honestly, I could probably say is the single most successful one that came out of that class. He's like, dude, did you not take biology? And he goes, well, I took it. <laughs> yeah. I, t I mean, what do, you, what do you call taking? Yeah. What's your definition of taking? Yeah. I mean, I just don't know. And this was 25 years ago, right? Am I that old? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was, it was, it was just different. It was different back then. And he didn't have it. I don't know what a lot of these guys do. You know, I didn't know. So I wasn't surprised. I was just glad that he, I thought, I remember thinking, cause I managed a lot of his life. Cause he was up, you know, in a marriage, they say someone's the balloon and someone's the rock. He mm -hmm. was like the biggest Goodyear blimp on the planet earth. And I was the most uptight, neurotic, best rock you could. I mean, there was no fun, no joy, no nothing. And he would just float around. And so I was like, I mean, I think I probably said like, you need to go back to school because we needed a transition. We needed something where like he learned how to type. Because remember, we have tutors and stuff in college. And so, oh, and they, we have lots of practices and we need a lot of help. And so I would just remember thinking, I don't think he can go get a job. Like that would just be a disaster. Like he'd be like, and also your ego has to adjust to being yeah. nothing from being like signing autographs as a Super Bowl champion to being like an assistant to, I don't know, whatever you get when you're 24, 25. So school seemed like the best way to slowly modulate back to a normal life, like have things responsible and you have due dates and deadlines. So, and he had this, he had a dream to help people, but he had no idea what it meant to be a social worker or how much you made. And he couldn't comprehend. And I remember when he finished, he graduated valedictorian, which was exceptional because he barely got out of Chapel Hill. And he went to an interview and he's like, they said it's $50,000 for the year. He said, I don't even know. That is slavery. I was like, that's a wrong word. And he's, <laughs> he was like, he's like, and you know, every time I fucking want to take a vacation, I have to ask somebody with a sheet and put the dates down. I mean, 
What are they? I mean, he was he the could, TPM forms or whatever they're called. He, yeah, he was just like, "What are you talking about?" And he's like, "I get ten days." And I was like, "Welcome to the world, buddy." <laughs> but it was so he couldn't believe it. He was just floored. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? He was floored. He was like, "This is outrageous." Because football, you have like a good four months off to do whatever, and you've got money in the bank, and your people high fiving you, and life is good. And then you go back to, and they're like, "You could." I remember listening to him talk to HR, and he's like. So what if I don't want to, what if I want more vacation days? And they're like, nope. <laughs> it was like, this is, he was just blown away by it. So he was pretty depressed during that period of our life. And I remember, I remember early on being like, listen, I didn't sign up for, I, I need to know, can you do this? Are, are we going to make this? Because you already had Jack, right? I had Jack and I said, I don't know what you have to do to make, I didn't need him to be happy, but I, I was like, with this transition, it, we, we knew going into it that this was a problem. Most, most guys, I think 70% end up broke and divorced after they're done. That's a really big number. That's staggering. Of people that just fall apart. And the average year, years you play is three. So I mean, that's a lot of people that are literally falling off a cliff after they do professional football. In their mid-20s. Mid twenties with and they, and they're probably the heroes. So they go home and they like work at a bar in their high school town because they they, they want to feel good again. Um, so we were just determined to find a new way, but it was bumpy. It was bumpy. Um, he was sad. He was sad, and Nate was always very aware when he. I don't know if he had anxiety, but I know he had depression, and I know that um, he didn't want to feel bad, and he hated that he didn't. He didn't know why, and he worked really hard. I mean, he was well read. And he would try everything. Um, and so after a while, once he kind of started to find some purpose in the social work, it got better. And then at a certain point, he's like, I can't live on this salary. And like every good athlete does, he decided to go into financial advising because there's nobody you want to manage your money more than a football player. <laughs> no, but he was great. And he really, he felt that he'd seen so many guys lose a bunch of money to the wrong people. So he loved finance. He loved investments. He's a, he loved gambling. So that's kind of what the stock market is in its own way. And so he moved into that at Morgan Stanley and loved it and ended up starting helping guys that were in unions, like just line workers and Verizon guys, just like blue class, blue collar guys that just needed help with the money that they'd saved, making sure it was invested well. So he kind of felt like he got the Allentown and the finance stuff and was able to serve. And so that ended up being his career that he took on for the rest of his life. And when did you guys start to have those discussions about, hey, where's the 230 pound version of you who's kind of getting back into what you know you had sort of imagined yeah. life post NFL would look like? I mean, day one. I mean, I rode that man so hard for his whole life. He could take more beatings from me verbally and from coaches and teams. I just, I was tough. I, I was like, you, you're, this is not going to work. You, you don't look good. You're not healthy. And he would, he was always, he wanted to be better. And so he would have times when he would get really in shape. And he was probably the guy in our neighborhood that everybody listened to health wise, because he had all the information. There was just certain things he, he, you know, he would, he would always do like sober January, February. And then when the sun would come out again, get a little dicey March, April, by the summer, he was full board, just having a ball and then forget about it. Once the Yankees started, wheels were off and we would cycle through that. Did he ever go visit a doctor during this period of time? So the NFL has a program where you go once a year. So I, I don't know the details on this. So don't hold me on this, but you either, you sign something where you either say, you'll never sue them again and we'll give you care. Like you go every year to an NFL, um, some type of physical, or you can do your own thing, but we're not going to take care. I, I don't know the details, but we chose the one where we, we took some money. You take a lump sum of something uh, and then you can't ever sue them about certain things. And then they kind of put you in a program where they check in with you every year, mentally, physically. Mm -hmm. And so he would do that. But I now looking back, I actually found his records from his last year. And he had told me like everything was fine. And then I everything was fine except for this one page that was so not fine, um, which was his heart and his cholesterol and his weight. And we didn't really talk about that. I mean, one thing I think if I could go back and do different things in my marriage, I would have had a different tactic because I think I, I was so scared that I was mean and then it didn't feel safe for him to tell me the truth. So he just put it aside and was like, I'll, I'll deal with that. I'll take care of it, but I'm not going to get into it with her. Um, but I always wanted him to be 
skinnier. And his mom, I mean, it was the biggest thing that his mom used to say to him was like, please lose the weight, please lose the weight. But it was really hard for him. Was he still exercising, lifting oh, weights yeah. and things like that? He always worked out very physical, very athletic. I mean, he was, he was still really good. We played football every Thanksgiving in El Segundo and he was great. He fast, talented, strong. Yeah. People don't appreciate that. You'd think, well, what's a defensive lineman or defensive tackle? Like they're so big, but they can't be that fast. They are so fast. He was the most athletic man I've ever seen. He could, he was the strongest man I've ever seen. And he had a work ethic physically that he, he would just, he could go forever. He could also rest forever too. He was extreme. In every, in every way, good and bad. So your daughter was born in what year? 2008. Got it. Okay. So fast forward to November of 2017. Yeah. You had some premonitions that something mm -hmm. wasn't right. I mean, how, how much of that do you think you now look back at and think, I, I can only appreciate this now through the retrospectoscope versus at the time, did you think there's something wrong with me? Like I'm really losing it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two parts to that. My friends will tell you, you were very vocal. Something was wrong. So I have witnesses that remember for about two or three years, like something's wrong with her. She can't settle. She's anxious. And I would say, I don't know what's wrong. Something's not right. And I was so scared. I was nervous. Um, travel had become just really. What were you doing at the time? Were you still working? So as I was a working in rep? Chapel Hill. Okay. Um, no, I was working in recruiting, mm -hmm. in medical recruiting. And so the, the team that I had in Chapel Hill was a group of guys that I'd gone to college with that played football. And so I would go back every month because my team was there. And for years, I started in 2012, it was fine. But then around 2014, 15, I started just dreading leaving the family. But it made no sense. The kids were in a great age. Nate was doing great. But my anxiety was through the roof. I'd wake up sweating. I'd wake up. And how long each month would you have to be gone? Maybe three or four days. Do you think you were anxious that Nate couldn't handle getting them to school on time? Or what, what, what do you think was upsetting you? I mean, I don't know how woo-woo spiritual I can get here. But I, I felt like something was coming. It's the best way I can describe it. Something's coming, and the message to me was prepare. Like somehow, something's coming that's big. You don't know what it is. I can't explain it. But, And there was something about Nate that was floating away, and I was trying to get to him, and I was also trying to manage this unexplained anxiety that... Had you ever experienced anxiety growing up? Like were you an anxious person by nature? Not, I mean, I, I wonder what my friends would say. I wasn't anxious, but I, I needed to swim six hours a day. So I don't know. I don't know what that means. I've always, you, you know. have energy. Yeah, a, a lot of energy. But I don't remember being nervous or fearful. I wasn't a lot of fun. Like, I wasn't the party girl. I didn't do drugs. I wasn't like, let's stay out all night. I was always like, we need to get home. And very responsible, but I wasn't anxious. But I never was, I never was a let go. I was never like, let's just see where, where the wind takes us. Um, but I didn't have panic attacks and those, you know, the nights, the, the nights that are just, you can't stop your brain going. Those became more and more and more the two years before he died. Um, and I had this sensation. Did you ever talk with him about it? All the time. What would you say? Please don't die. What would he say? I promise I'm not going to, I won't leave you. Don't worry. I, I'm here. And I, something I would say like, I can't live without you. Like you're my best friend. You're, you're like the only person I know. Like you're the best dad in the world. I'll cry thinking about it. And he would be like, I'm right here. I'm never going to leave you. Um, and fast forward, I, I don't think he has, but um, in many ways, but yeah. And I, I just was like, Nate, I can't, I don't know what's wrong with me. And he's like, you just need to calm down. Need, and his big thing was just stop being afraid. What are you so afraid of? You're so, he used to say like, you walk around so afraid of everything. Like, what if you just knew everything was okay? Like, he's like, everything's okay, babe. Like, you're okay. We're okay. The kids are okay. And that was always his message. And there was nights that I would go to bed and he would be watching a show. And he was always watching something really masculine, like Oprah's, you know, final show. And he'd just be sobbing, you know, and or Mr. Holland's Opus or some like <laughs> show that just like, he just, and he would just cry. And and I would say, what, I'd come out and say, like, what's wrong? He's like, I just hope I, I hope I have enough time. I hope that I can make a difference in this world. And 
there, there came a point where I, I would wake up and I couldn't find him and I felt like he was gone and I'd scream for him and he would be like, I'm right here. I'm in the other room, but it, you'd literally scream. It I wasn't literally a dream. would. And, and the only reason I know this is all true is because I would tell my friends, you guys, I wake up and I scream and I feel like Nate's gone and he always comes in and he says, I'm right here. Don't worry about it. But so those things started to happen. And, and in conjunction with that, I said, well, I need help. So that's when I started to really dig into self-help and spiritual books. And I was like, where is, there's gotta be an answer here. And it turns out there wasn't an answer, but there was a huge toolkit I was about to be given for what I think I knew was coming. And tell me more about that. So I feel like every, when I started reading, um, obviously Vision's book, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, and, and that's kind of a book that I talk about because it, it, it was pivotal for Nate and I. We read it together and then we gave it to Tony. And when we gave it to Tony, he loved it so much and he's a big seeker of information. And he then contacted Vision, who wrote the book, and through a bunch of beautiful synchronicities, I got an opportunity to go to this um, event in Jamaica. And it was, I grew up in a spiritual family. Everybody, you know, Wayne Dyer, Esther Perel, we did Course in Miracles, um, very open-minded religiously. Everybody could believe what they wanted. The idea was about love and God and being fearless. I come from a very fear-based family, but we really believed in being fearless. Just no one had mastered it quite yet. Um, and so Nate kept saying, like, I don't, you've got to fix this. I don't know what's going on with you, but you can't keep living like this. And meanwhile, Nate was just crushing life at this point. He was starting a nonprofit in Watts, and he was doing great in his career. And he was just really happy, but there was something about him that I felt like he was, I mean, this is so cheesy, but floating away. I couldn't get to him the way I couldn't. His eyes didn't see him. He seemed um, far away. He would forget things. Um, he, like he was, we were barbecuing and he put all the lighter fluid on the fence and then lit, lit the match and the whole fence lit up. That's not like, where are my keys? So what mm -mm. did you think about that? I, I just thought like, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. Like, did you think he was being funny no, deliberately? No, because he, he felt terrible after. He hated himself after. He would berate himself. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't remember. And he would forget his keys always. And he would, um, he would make little mistakes. So I don't know that he knew something was wrong with him too. And I can tell because he started doing like mind exercises and he was trying to get going there. He would just say like, I don't know why I feel so down. He felt really sad. Um, the last year of his life, he was just, and it wasn't depression as much as it was just, it wasn't him. I don't, I, it's hard to describe, but besides Tony and Jeff, who else was he still in touch with regularly, closely from the NFL? All of them. All most, I mean, all the guys that coach for meal. So they were retired by then as well. How many of these guys could understand what he was talking about? I don't know that he talked about it with a lot of people. Um, his best friend, Chris, in the neighborhood was like, he just won't share anything anymore. He doesn't see him himself. Tony will say that Nate was always Nate. And I do think when Nate would get around his buddies and they're all drinking, he would be much more normal. It was more when we were at home. And that the hard part is Nate was always different. So, but he wasn't always so sad. There was a sadness to Nate. Did the kids appreciate this? They'll tell, they don't remember this at all. It was subtle and it was subtle in a way that sometimes I don't even know if it was, I don't know what it was. It was just everything in me said something's wrong and I know everything in him. I, I got his, like I found his journals after he passed and a lot of them were like, you've got to be more connected. You're going to find joy again. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, keep going, you know, just try harder, like very much self-talk, um, trying to get out of whatever he was in. How long after he died did you find the, the journal? Very soon. Did you read it right away? Mm -hmm. Did you hesitate for a moment? Were you Not worried about what you would find? No. The one thing about Nate and I was like, I never, I didn't feel like he hid anything from me. No, not, not oh, that just, he was hiding anything from you, but oh. were you afraid that you might see that he was in a pain that you didn't appreciate? I feel that I didn't, I wasn't worried about that then because I didn't know what I know now. Um, I honestly didn't know how sick he was. Once I found out, I was devastated because I was so mean. <laughs> I was mean. I was, I did, I didn't know what was wrong with him. And so I wish I could, and I wish I could go back and be kinder, but I had no clue. And he was somebody who just was like, he wouldn't put it on me. He would just deal with it on his own. 
So I wish I could have, if I had known he was so sick, I would have been much kinder, much kinder. Um, so no, I didn't, I don't, I don't really know what I felt at the time. I would be making it up if I said it just felt like I was losing my husband and he seemed different from all the other husbands. He seemed older and tireder quickly. That's the thing. Like I remember Tony and he were, it was Halloween right before he died. And I remember thinking like, why does Tony look so young and vibrant? And Nate looks so tired and exhausted. Um, and there's a thousand reasons why now that now we know, but so you want me to keep going with the Jamaica story? Yeah. So it's, it's, so it's November. early November mm -hmm. of 2017 and you don't want to go on this trip. Right. So we go to New York about a month before for a birthday and I have probably the biggest and the last panic, one of the last panic attacks that I've had of my life. Um, and I just said, Nate, I can't go to Jamaica. And, and he takes his sleep apnea mask off and we're in Midtown, you know, and he's like, listen, you lunatic, you're going on this trip. You need to live, you need to learn to live fearlessly. Like you have all these gifts and you are trapped in our house and in all this fear and it's time for you to go. And I want you to go on that trip and I want you to come back changed. And, and, and he's, and he never told me what to do. He was very supportive, but he was like, this is a non-negotiable if we're going to make it, I cannot live with this anymore. You are fine. We are good. I promise you everything's okay. And he was serious. Like I, he was very rarely serious, but he was like, you're going like, I'm not, we're not doing this. And so the weekend of November 8th, I, he took me to the airport and he never took me to the airport because the guy loved to sleep. And so it was an early flight, but he's like, I want to drive you, which was very out of character for him. He'd, he had no problem putting his wife in an Uber. Zero. <laughs> Zero. He'd be like, good luck. You're good. So I remember we He could were, even call the Uber, right? I mean, yeah, he would do everything. <laughs> Jerk. Um, so we were driving to the airport and I remember I was texting with Toby because she was, we got, so long story short, we got invited to go to this event in Jamaica. It was like a spiritual retreat. Wim Hof, Stephen Cutler. Um, Marissa Piers, Jim Quick, great speakers, people doing great things. And Toby, through their relationship, Tony and Toby's with Vision, we got to go to this event called A-Fest. And it's a, it's a three or four day event twice a year where you go and you just talk to people that are doing great things and look into your stuff and hear great speakers. So I, I'm texting Toby and Nate grabs my hand and he never did this. And he was like, can you put your phone down? Can you just put your phone down? This will break me. And he said, just, I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you for this next five minutes until we get out and then you can text her. And so we just held hands and he drove, you know, he drove me to the terminal and he just said like, you're the most amazing woman I've ever met in my life. He's like, I've never met anybody like you. Wow. I'm really crying. Um, he said, but I just want you to know, I love you more than anything. And I hope you go have fun and that you come back a better person and ready to do what I know you're meant to do. And I don't want you to worry about anything because we are going to be fine. And, you know, I just, I love you so much. So go have fun. And we kissed and I went on. And of course, because I've always been very cheap, I decided not to get the um, talk plan in Jamaica. So we just texted for four days, the most beautiful text you could ever imagine. Um, just about what I was learning and how supportive he was. And he was like, you're doing so great. This is awesome. I was like, I'm going to be different. I'm going to move more during sex. It's going to be great. Like, <laughs> you're going to love this. And then it was the last day. And I remember Wim Hof had just spoken and his wife had died when she was young and he was left with four kids. And I remember thinking like, that would suck. That would suck so bad if your spouse left, especially a good one, you know? So I went and I got in the water and I was swimming because we had one more, um, event. It was like a bike, a boat, a, a boat excursion. I remember I was swimming in the water and I felt like I, I felt the divine all around me. And I remember thinking like, everything's changed. Like everything's changed. Like I get it now. Like I don't need mm. to be afraid. I could breathe. And I, I, I thought to myself, I can't wait to tell Nate, he's going to be so happy. And if you knew the time I was swimming in the water and you knew what was happening yeah. in Los Angeles, it would blow your mind. So I got out of the water and I was still in my suit, put on some jean shorts and I was getting ready to go smoke some Jamaican weed and get on a boat and just, you know, be the new Kelsey, just like in the moment. And my phone rang a couple times and it was a number I didn't know. And I was like, not today, you know, I'm, I'm in Jamaica I'm doing the thing. And then my best friend called and she said, listen, I don't want you to do the Kelsey. I don't want you to freak out. And she said, but Nate was at 
um, Sky Zone Trampoline Park, and he fell. We don't really know what happened. We're going to go, your, your brother-in-law is going to go get the kids, and your mom's heading over to UCLA. But everything's fine. Go on to the boat. And I remember I just took a breath, and I was like, he's dead. And she's like, he's not dead. And everything Peter in my body knew that man was gone. Like, Everything. And so I felt like I was just waiting for the rest of the world to catch up to what I already knew, which was this was the thing. Because I also, when I got to Jamaica, all my anxiety went away. It was almost like sliding doors. And once I made the decision to go on that trip, this was, this was what was going to happen. And I assumed that if Nate was smart, he knows if I had been there, I would have been like, you don't die on me. Like I would have been crazy. So on some level, I think he waited till the last day because I had gotten all the information and I'd met all the people and so many of the people from Jamaica have been super influential in my recovery and my grief work and some of the psychedelic things. And so I told Toby, I was like, we're going to the airport. She's like, this is ridiculous. Everything's fine. And I was like, I didn't even, I wasn't even talking. I was just like packing and I was like, get me. And there was one, one flight and I was like, get us to the airport. And so we were driving down this Jamaican road with like potholes and I was in a taxi and the phone rang and I knew it it was my mom and she said the doctor would like to speak with you and I took the phone and he said I'm so sorry Mrs. Chittick we tried everything we worked on him for 50 minutes because he looks so young but um, he didn't make it and I remember I said you know is he dead and he said your husband had a heart attack and I said is my husband dead and he said yes Nate is dead and then I just said to them, with no emotion, he's dead. And Toby mm. was like, who's dead? And I was like, Nate's dead. And she screamed. And, and then began what would be the most transformative, painful, and probably beautiful last four and a half years of my life. So how long did it take you to get back to LA? So there was one plane going back to the US that day. So it was late Saturday night. And I knew I had to get home to my kids because they didn't know. And I really didn't even know what they'd seen. And that's another discussion we'll get into because I didn't really know. There's a million things around that. But they thought th that he had fallen. But as they, now we, I know more about what they thought. But there was one seat left. And when I got to the airport, they were like, you, there's not enough time. It was like 20 minutes. The door was shut. And through a thousand miracles, and I will say, and I tell this to people all the time, in your biggest challenges and crises, there are angels literally all around you. I mean, I, I envision them just God gives you or whatever you believe that the people show up for you and it is miraculous. So this one baggage claim guy was like, just hold on. And somehow he talked to them and it's in Jamaica too. People are a little more laid back and they opened the door, which I really didn't think was ever humanly possible. I think it's like the one thing I've never seen happen in life. Right, right. Like, you know, yeah. like they're like, nope. It's an FAA commandment. Or exactly. Something. So I got on the plane and I had the last seat. I was in an aisle and I went into shock and you know much more about the brain than I do. But I remember thinking, oh shit, this is like what you see on TV when the woman's kid dies and she like just falls apart. And I felt like I was having a break with reality. So I started throwing up in the little white bag and I was hyperventilating. And I couldn't, I couldn't come back to, I, I couldn't integrate it. I'd never had had an experience where you, you thought you were going crazy. And so nobody talked to me at all, which I wouldn't have talked to me. Now I always talk to people when I see them like that, but I think they were like enjoying their honeymoon or their girl's trip and they're like lunatic, you know, in aisle seven, like get away from her. So I just, I panicked for about 20 minutes and then the, um, the seatbelt sign went off and all of a sudden there's this beautiful Jamaican woman in this gorgeous dress and she's standing next to me in the row, in the aisle and she puts her hand on my shoulder and she puts a hand on my forehead and she says, baby girl, I don't know what you're going through or what awaits you on the other side of this plane. But I want you to know that there are so many people praying for you and God loves you and I love you and you are stronger than you think. And she said, um, she said, slow your breathing down, baby girl, and decide who you want to be when you land, when, when this plane lands. And I don't know what it was but I, it, it recalibrated my breathing and she kind of just patted my shoulder. She left and then I actually spent the next four hours on that flight, the layover in Texas, and then the flight home deciding hopefully who I would be, you know, a week from now, 
a month from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, because on that plane ride, I got really clear that they had just lost their dad, but they weren't going to lose me. And that kind of became my North Star from then on. And I got home. I went to my mother-in-law. My mom picked me up, probably the worst drive you could ever imagine, from LAX at about midnight. And I went to my friend's house. And um, do you want me to go into this part? Yeah. This is the part that you just, you can't make it better. But I got to my friend's house where my kids were. They were 9 and 12 at the time. And they had been waiting all day. And I had lied to them. And they said, is dad okay? And I had said over FaceTime, you know, he's not doing well. But, you know, let's just keep praying for him. And I, because I, I, I couldn't bear to tell them over the phone. I had to be there. And so now it's funny because we joke about that. Like you lied about really big things. I'm like, I know I did, but I, I've admitted to it. So I got there and I gave them both a hug and I asked everybody to leave. And I just said, I said three things. I said, um, your father would have never left us if we weren't going to be okay. It just wasn't his style. Do you understand me? And they nodded. I like, yes, mom. And then I said, um, I need you to know that I'm enough. I have no idea how I'm going to do this. I don't know how to live life without your father. I don't know how to raise you guys without your father, but I'm certain I'm going to figure it out and we're going to have a great life. And you guys need to stay being nine and 12 and don't need to worry about anything because I've got this. Do you understand? And I said, yes, mom. And then I said, the most important thing I need you to know is that you are not victims that you had the best father for nine and 12 years and he focused all of his energy on you. He loved you with everything he had and he was the kindest, most patient, amazing human being I've ever met. And some kids don't get that for a day. So just always remember that you're the lucky ones. Do you understand? And they were like, yes, mom. And then I asked them both and they were tiny. And I said, what do you guys need from me? And they said, if you're okay, we're okay. And so, I mean, I tell every mother, like you would become okay too. Mm. Um, and that's what we've done. We kind of, from that point on, fought for joy while acknowledging excruciating pain and doing it at the same time. Now the days got pretty dark still. Oh yeah. The first two years were just brutal, brutal. Tell me about the lowest lows. I think the first night, if you've ever lost someone suddenly, you feel like you're, you've been set on fire. I, I can't explain the physical pain of grief. I always thought it was mental, but um, grief is grief and trauma is very physical. Um, you want to get out of your body. You know, I never understood why people cut. I never understood why you, I never understood suicide. I never understood, uh, you know, dri people driving into trees. When the pain is so big, you have no way to describe it. And I had tons of resources and love and support, and I still thought, like, this isn't going to work. Um, the beginning was surreal, and I just, it's, it's hard to imagine how you're going to live in a world that so quickly becomes a planet you've never been on. Um, he was everything to us. Like, he was, he was, he was the guy. Um, I didn't even know an adult life without him in it. And he was a much better parent than me in a thousand ways. So I knew early on, like, we had a huge deficit when it came to honesty, <laughs> spirituality, kindness, service. He was just exceptional. I was great at like scheduling carpools and I was like, well, shit, that's not going to lead to like a good kid. You know, that <laughs> we've got problems here. Um, and I think when the numbness wore off of like the, the memorials over and there was a thousand hard times. I think the morgue was exceptionally awful to go see him and see him dead. Which you didn't want to do at all. You fought like hell not to. Yeah. I mean, I remember thinking like, what are you fucking kidding me? I'm not going to go see my, I'm not going to say goodbye to my husband dead. Like I thought it was insane that someone would offer that, um, by the grace of God. And I, this is, I don't have much advice about anything, but if people have been through it, trust them, they know this. And I had another angel that was like, you have to go say goodbye to your husband. And I had a, probably one of the most beautiful experiences, um, because I, I got some closure that I never thought I would get. And I have a great story of when I went to the morgue and, and I, you know, it was an awful experience and there was police and there's nurses and they pulled him out of a freezer and he's just laying there and he has, he's still intubated 
But somehow all that fades away and I just started to talk to him and my best friend was there and I talked to him for about 10 or 15 minutes, just told him how much I loved him and how grateful I was and how, you know, I would do the best for him and the kids. And then when I got up, my, I asked my best friend, like, how'd it go? And she's like, reminded me a lot of real life. You just talked at him for a long time and he just stared at you kindly. <laughs> and it's like, that's so true. Um, so the morgue was tough. The corners was awful. Death is such a business and there's the legality and the... Do they ask you if you would like an autopsy given that no yeah, foul you, play? It's, so it's when you, your option. Right? No, when you die in a public place in oh, LA, yeah. you have to do a... I see. You have to do a autopsy. So that was on the books from the beginning. Um, I think the, at about six months, I thought this won't work. And I've never had... When you say this... Life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've never had suicidal thoughts. I've been depressed. I've been down. I've been anxious, but I never thought like, how do we get out of here? Did you ever find yourself thinking like these kids now are the greatest thing I have and they're my anchor to him, but they're also kind of the anchor that's holding me to this earth. Like it's a very different calculation to think about ending your life with kids versus without. Well, my mom used to always tell you the one thing you lose once you have kids is the right to kill yourself. She used to say that all the time. She's like, you know what else? You can't even kill yourself once you have them because it wouldn't be fair to them. And I remember thinking that. But I also remember thinking, I want to take them with me. I remember thinking like, we got to get to him. There was this, a couple nights where I thought, so this isn't going to work. I've tried everything. This doesn't work. I feel lost. I'm, I'm so broken. I'm so scared. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially. I didn't know how we were going to do it. And... So I, I ended up, I mean, I, I, people talk about this in the chapter, but I ended up just saying like, I'm going to talk to my son because I knew he was 12 and I knew he was in a bad spot. So when, uh, tell me about that. Tell me about like what you saw in both of them over that six month period of time. Just like, I mean, if you have kids, just like, especially I'm guessing like after Christmas, right? So it was, my guess is it's a blur through Thanksgiving and Christmas it's hell, yep. and then January. Just so dark dark in every way. Like it's January's dark to begin with, but when you've lost the person that you worshiped and the person that kind of was the light in our family, like he was just, he was great. He was a great dad. They were so sad and confused and just a different level of sad, like the saddest, like they just got screwed for their whole lives and they'll never be normal again. And kids just want to be normal and they want to go to school and they don't want to be the person that's dealing with the great tragedy. Um, they were embarrassed. They were. How do you know that? They would say it's just like the worst to not have a dad. It's so embarrassing not to have a dad. Mm. You know, like it's just awful. And like nobody will talk to me. Jack says no one. He says no one makes fun of me anymore. No one jokes with me. Parents look down when I walk past them. He said everyone avoids me. So because you don't know what to say. And then there's always the kids who the parent was like, you go say something to them. And mm. they're like, sorry, your dad died. <laughs> you know, or something like that. But we just, I couldn't, we'd done a bunch of counseling. Counseling wasn't working at the time. We couldn't find the right fit for everybody. And I've learned a lot about trauma since then, but I think it was a little early for the kids to be forced to talk about it. And I don't know if you've read um, What Happened to You, the Oprah Winfrey no. book with um, Bruce. I don't know who, I don't know. But she talks about like kids, it takes a while for them to be able to process what they saw and felt. Whereas adults, we have enough life experience to, to be able to talk about it. But watching their dad die wasn't something they could talk about, but I kept trying to force them to do counseling and be like, tell us about the day your dad died. And they would just, you know, they would close their ears literally physically and rock. And I'd be like, I am, no, you, we are going to talk about this. So I did a lot of things that I thought That's was, really interesting. They would literally react that way. Like a baby. Like they would go like. Like I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. And what did the therapist think of that? Did they recognize that as a sign that they just weren't ready to talk yes. about this yet? Yeah. I mean, eventually, eventually, but they would do things like, and I don't want to say stupid things, but like my daughter didn't want to draw about it. She didn't want to like take a crayon and show her dad dying at Sky Zone. Um, she really needed to forget about it for a bit to integrate what she saw. My son's a little more mature and he really needed someone to talk to other than me. Like he needed someone who didn't have a dog in the fight to talk about what it felt like to lose his dad. So he actually over time had a great relationship with a therapist for a year. And then as the 40 year old that he is inside at the end, he was like, I think I'm done for now. Thank you so much for your help. And I'll call you if I need you again. But Jack really had, um, a clear intention at that age of what he needed through this. 
And he said, it's just nice to go talk to a woman that will listen to me. And that was a, a dig at me because he's like, all you do is talk to me. Um, but there was just a night that I thought like, we got to go, Jack. Like we got we to gotta get to dad. And so I said, you know, Jack, I'm thinking about killing all of us in tongue and cheek, which we use a lot of laughter. And Jack was like, tell me how we're going to die, mom. And I was like, well, there's so many different ways, but I, I think the best one is that I'm going to drown you guys in the tub. And he's like, great. He's how old at this point? He's 13. He's 13. 13 yeah. And he's like four inches taller than me. Um, he's like, but you only let us fill the, you know, there's a drought in LA. So you only let us fill it up like two inches. I'm not, and he's like, I'm so much stronger than you. I'm like, I know, but it's, I'm going to do the best I can. He's like, okay, good luck. And it, the more we talked about the stuff and the more we laughed, the better it got. And then a couple weeks later, Jack said, you know, mom, I, 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 if I had a gun, I would kill myself. And I said, you know, I totally get it. I didn't say like, that's awful. Don't do it. Cause I, I understood. And I just remember thinking, well, we just won't have guns in our house. That's what and we never did. But I, I remember thinking, I, I know how to avoid this. And I said, just hang on for today and then tomorrow. And little by little, like, he's like, I don't think I want to kill myself anymore. Um, so we navigated through that. The first year was just the crying at night and the nights are really dark when you have grief and when you have little kids because they need so much because they are at night is when everybody, whether you're an adult, I don't know. I mean, I wake up in the middle of the night or I used to quite a bit with just terrible anxiety and their fear was so big. And I just didn't think I had enough energy to be there for them on my own. How were you sleeping? I mean, I don't remember. I don't remember sleeping the first year very much because I was always, somebody always needed something the first year at nights. Such as, meaning the kids themselves the kids, couldn't somebody, sleep. Somebody or... would be crying. Somebody would be losing it. Someone would be um, not well. And you slept in three different rooms? Mm -hmm. Well, for a lot, many times we slept together. Um, my daughter slept with me for a long time after he died. And just she wanted to call, crawl back in my uterus. Like I, I thought to myself, like, I'll never be able to leave the house again. Like my life's over. Like I'll never be able to have fun again. I'll never be happy again. But amongst all of that, I also thought we're going to be okay. Like there was an, there was a under, there was a knowing somewhere that like this was just part of it, but it wasn't always going to be this way, but it felt like it was always going to be this way. So I toggled through hopefulness and just devastation. But I knew we needed to hold on to the fact that this was appropriate and it wouldn't last forever. Like there, we were built to last. Like humans are built to last. We aren't the first people who lost their father. I think our generation hasn't lost as many people as generations before. So it's just much more rare for us and it's more shocking, but this has been happening. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that like you sort of imagine Let's just go back in time 10,000 years. Not that right. far, but just 10,000 years. <laughs> Perfect. And it's basically the same thing. It's you and Nate and the kids. Yeah. Um, you know, you're hunter-gatherers, so it's a little different. <laughs> you don't have electricity and all that stuff. But there's certainly a scenario in which Nate gets an infection and dies. There's a scenario in which an animal attacks him. I mean, like, as you said, sure. it's not that uncommon that this would happen. How, knowing what you know now, I mean, I've never thought about it this way, but do you get the sense that the the Kelsey of 10,000 years ago would have had an easier time with this? And if so, would it have been because of expectations or would it been have been because of the community that you would have been stuck with? Like you wouldn't have had your own house, for example. Right. Um, both. I think the expectation that now everybody lives till they're 90 happily ever after married with two kids and a mom and a dad, um, that expectation has set us up to be much, much less resilient because there's this like one way mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's all about joy and fun. Whereas I think 10,000 years ago, you saw people recover all the time from awful things. Babies died and people went to war and there was famine. We have so much now that our anxiety is higher than ever before. And I, I felt that way before I died because when everything, as opposed to being really joyful when you have it's everything. It's so counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because now you have everything. You don't want it to, you don't want to fall apart. Whereas back then they were like, well, shit, this is, this isn't that good. So whatever I can handle things. We just don't handle things. And we don't, um, we're not used to feeling extremely uncomfortable anymore. Life is so comfortable. Things are so easy. Not for everybody, yeah, obviously yeah. for people with resources. Well, I mean, I think for everybody compared to 10,000 years ago, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. And this idea that pain is bad and death is bad. And that's a whole discussion. Um, you know, now I have a completely different relationship with death. 
Um, I have a completely different relationship with what it means for the physical body to leave and that Nate isn't gone and we didn't get screwed and um, there wasn't a right time for him to leave or not. So there's so many nuances that through the last four and a half years have changed the way I feel. Um, I'm still toggling between all the different ideas around grief. You know, there's a whole, like my mother-in-law believes, like I will grieve forever. I will grieve forever. And that's just how it is. And our country wants everyone to be happy and I'm not happy. And I'm like, that's fine. And that's a choice. I, I personally now believe, again, I'm back to this, the football analogy, holding two beliefs at the same time. Um, I can be grieving very deeply and very grateful at the same time. They are, they don't have to be one. You don't go through one stage at the other. I miss Nate terribly and I am so happy. I don't know what to tell you. I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. And I've been through the worst thing ever. And then I had some medical stuff just, I think that came up from grief and all the things that I was most afraid of, I've made it through and I am so excited about life. So I don't know. So how long after Nate died, did you get the autopsy results back? So we got the heart part, which is, so he died of cardiomyopathy of the left ventricle. And the doctor called and just said, we could tell right away he was a football player. Um, his heart was so stretched out. It was so big. And he said, listen, Mrs. Chittick, you, you want all big muscles, just not a big heart. Nobody needs to have a big heart physically. You can have it spiritually, but you don't want a huge heart. And he said, when big men move that much weight around at that speed, it just, it's, it, it overuses it and the muscle just gives out. He said, big men and big animals die early. And he said, um, he was 98% blocked in all of his arteries. And, um, basically his left ventricle just had no more give. So he, he explained it to me as a water balloon that had just been stretched out and there was just no pump anymore. And he said, big fat people can live a long time if they sit all day and watch TV. But if you're out playing football at Thanksgiving and, you know, on the I'm treadmill on trampoline. yeah, and running, he would run the beach and jump on the trampoline. He's like, your heart it doesn't do that. He said, your, ha your husband had a huge, I mean, I love on his autopsy, it said he died of a enlarged heart, which mm. I just think is beautiful because he had a really big heart. You have to put that on the tombstone. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So that was, um, about three months after he died. And then, and did they also look at his brain? Presumably they didn't. And they then, did, but they didn't have the right tools. So they're like, I don't, we didn't see anything. I'm like, well, what did you do? I mean, it's LA County morgue or yeah. coroners. I don't, they don't think they have the equipment. So when did it first occur to you to maybe get the people at Boston university involved? We had just started to talk about this a couple of years before. And I had gotten like the pamphlet from the NFL that said, you know, whatever the players NFLPA, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there'd been a lot of talk. I hadn't watched um, Concussion yet with Will Smith. I have since then. But I I knew, and I, I if I'm being completely honest, I thought, oh, well, maybe there'll be some compensation financially if he did have CT. But I'm sure, I, I don't know if he did or I, I don't know. But I want to make sure because it would depend on whether I'd let Jack play. Because mm -hmm. he was going to Loyola and he was going to play football, most likely. So I said, I need to know if football had anything to do with it. The heart thing pretty much sealed the deal, but I was like, I wonder what was going on with Nate's brain. So Boston University was exceptional. Dr. McKee was exceptional. Lisa, the whole group there is phenomenal. And so uh, LA Corners sent his brain tissue and they coordinated it with Boston. And they went and they said, it'll be about a year because we're going to do a, um, we're going to, I don't I'm using the wrong words. We're like pathological and do interviews. Yeah. Get the clinical side. Clinical. Yeah. And so we're going to interview everybody and talk about it. And his parents had an even more feeling of him floating away and being different as did his brother. And I think I lived day to day with him. So it was harder to tell the, the changes because they were so gradual. Where did his brother live? He lives in LA. So we saw him a lot. Mm -hmm. And the irony is his brother is just an exceptional, been sober 14 years, but for so long we were trying to keep Luke alive. And it was just the way that it switched and Nate was gone and Luke is still here in a huge, huge part of our life. But Luke said he felt the same way. Like there was a floating away and his mom especially was like, he is not the son I knew five years ago. How long did she feel that? Five years? Five years. Five years. And his dad? His dad's just a kind man. He, he just, he, he said, um, he doesn't really know how he felt or he doesn't remember, but he knew that something was different about his son. 
but he can't put his finger on it. So about a year later, a um, little bit, no, maybe like nine months, we got a call and um, honestly, I didn't know, I didn't know what they were going to say, but I didn't think they were going to say what they said. And uh, Dr. McKee got on the phone and just said, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but you know, Nate had stage two, almost stage three uh, CTE. He has lesions all over his brain. And um, I just want you to know that that would have been a really hard life. So, you know, part of my ability to be in gratitude where a lot of other families that have football players aren't is that I don't have to live with a man that's slowly deteriorating before my eyes. There are tons of people who have husbands that are healthy heart-wise, but not brain-wise. So that's where it gets tricky and that's where I continue to talk about it. But again... And, you know, for people to sort of understand what stage two and stage three is, I mean, Junior Seau was stage two yeah. when he killed himself. Aaron Hernandez was stage three when he killed himself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you looked at them from the outside, notwithstanding sort of the criminal side of what was going on with Aaron, you know, they could tie their shoes and walk around. So you wouldn't look at them and say, well, they're, you know, they don't look like someone who's in the last stages of Alzheimer's exactly. disease. But if you understand their behavior, their moods and what people who are around them would say, and of course, in the case of Hernandez, his behaviors leading up to everything, um, they weren't, you know, they were clearly not behaving the way they would have behaved if everything was totally normal. Yeah. And I, I had seen Junior say I had a party about, um, cause we used to live in San Diego and, um, there's a good friend of ours who's a very close friend of his and it was his 70th birthday. And this was about a month before he killed himself. And I remember like just, he looked perfectly normal. Like everything was perfectly, you know, it's just great to see him and everything seemed totally fine. And I couldn't believe it a month later. Yeah. That's the thing about this disease. And I think it's why it causes so much, um, discussion and disagreements. And I mean, I debate this with football guys all the time. And then I debate it with the other side, which is my mother and mother-in-law that are like, it's football is the devil. And then all the people that we love that are like, listen, it's the name of the game, you know, signing up for it. Um, I don't, it's again, so it's time. Although, you know, you could push back on that and say, maybe that's true today. Was it true when they signed up for it? Yeah. Meaning Nate's generation. Yeah. I don't think anybody talked about it. I don't think everybody was lying about it for a really long time. And, and now it's interesting. I mean, just to fast forward, there is no compensation anymore for CTE and I'm, I'm making this up. So don't see me, but I I would think it's because anybody that dies that's played in the NFL probably has some level after the number of hits you take. Um, I don't know what to do. I, I cannot imagine living with Nate, the greatest man I ever knew with a severe brain disease that would either put us at risk or him at risk or at, at, at 42. I mean, that's young. That's very young. I mean, did the folks at BU, I don't know much about CTE. Um, did the folks there say, based on what we saw pathologically, this was what the next 10 years would have looked like? I mean, or this was the next five, like, could they tell you this is the rate at which this progresses and this is what you were in store for the next five years? We never got into that, but they said they would give you the list of symptoms of what it would look like. And a lot of it was already there with Nate, depression, um, increased drinking, wanting to be alone, fatigue, um, big outbursts, you know, anger. I mean, Nate never yelled at me in 21 years. I mean, he, we, we got after it in, in arguments, but he never was mean. And I remember I messed up like the internet or some spectrum thing. And he was like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like I told you to fix the internet. And I remember we both looked at each other and he was like, sorry. And I was like, whoa, I just had never heard him snap. And that stuff, I think what Dr. McKee was saying is that would have that increased. Was going to increase in mm-hmm. frequency. Because if you look at their brain scans, there's just dead spots or like the lesions look like they're just like sitting on that brain and nothing's firing there or it's firing incorrectly. Um, it's not like CT makes you nicer, you know, <laughs> you know, like some people have to mention they're kinder. It's not that way. Um, this is one of the trickiest how, things. How did you tell the kids about that? I and told, was there solace in that? I mean, was that, they actually, do not find any solace in it, which is interesting. Because I, you obviously do. I do a ton. They do not, they go, they'll be like, mom, please. Like, okay, we know he had CT, but he's still dead. We'd rather him be here. They have no... I, my son always says like, mom, please stop telling people we're lucky. He hates it. Is it possible that he didn't witness what you witnessed? Uh, in other words, he never saw that his dad was deteriorating? hundred percent. 
And I think he was little. I mean, he worshiped his dad. He was just 12, you know, he was in sixth grade. Um, I don't think any, they, he was their hero. He, they, he, he never did anything wrong in their eyes. He was the best. So they are like, I don't know what, what story you're making up about this CTE thing, but that's, I don't, we can't even comprehend dad not being dad. Um, so I try to honor that now because, yeah. but I will say what Jack did honor was I'll never play football. And there was something in my son's eyes that was grateful he didn't have to. He won't admit that, but I promise you when he's 40, he'll tell you, I didn't want to go do that sport. Yeah. He loves it. I mean, he, he, he was, I've never seen a kid so happy last night as the, when the Rams won. He loves being a part of football. He loves football. He loves watching it. We have great discussions around this in our home. Um, they just don't like when I say we're lucky because we didn't have to see him sick. Because in their world, they're like, we would rather. So how long after Nate died did you have a good night's sleep without medication? That's interesting. We'll talk about psychedelics at the same time. But I, you know, the first couple of weeks, people were like, you need Xanax, you need Ambien. I'd never taken anything. And I remember I took them for about a week and I, I woke up and I was like, God, I feel so far away from everything. And that was the first experience I had of like traditional medicine taking you away from your pain and other things bringing you to it so you can work through it, which we'll discuss. But Yeah, um, the exact opposite, right? Yeah, <laughs> the exact opposite, which is mind-blowing. I remember maybe seven or eight months in, sleep became a really safe place for me. How long after Nate died would you wake up and not have that nanosecond of forgetting what had happened? Do you, do you know that experience yeah. where... Yeah. Like the next day you wake up and there's probably like two seconds when right. you don't know that that just happened. And then it kind of comes crushing down. Yeah. And then at some point that goes away. And there's never a moment when you don't know it didn't happen. Uh, maybe the last six months. Wow. It I was, wouldn't have imagined it could last that long. It was jarring. It, to be honest, it still gets me sometimes. And sometimes I'll lay in my bed and be like, Nate, just to practice saying his name. Because it's it's a surreal experience because it's like... um. It's alter worlds. There's just no sudden death. I think it's just, you know, everyone asks, oh, would it, you rather be sick or would you rather, you know, die suddenly? I love the games we play with, yeah. with people grieving. But, Which again, do you think 10,000 <laughs> years ago they sat around the right. fire ever would playing you that cancer or die in front of you? Would I'm, you rather get killed by a saber tooth tiger <laughs> immediately or fall out of the tree, break your femur <laughs> and exsanguinate over the next two days, then get an infection and then die a month later? It's exactly what people ask me all the time. Yeah. You know, I don't, I still, I can believe it completely and I still can't believe it. I don't wake up shocked anymore. I don't have the pit in my stomach. The deep um, shock and grief is gone. It's probably been gone since around four years. So I'm a couple months, uh, maybe even three and a half, there started to be some space that some type of new neural pathways that we lived in now were becoming not as worn, but as comfortable as the old ones were of the reality he lived in. So for a while, it felt like every neuro pathway ended with Nate. Every time the door would open, I would think of Nate. Every time we would eat dinner, I would think of Nate. Every time I put the kids to bed, every time I'd get in the car, he was everywhere. He was like, it was like a shadow. And over time, the more things we did, the more traveling I did, the more um, new people I met, things started firing differently. People that didn't know Nate places that I hadn't gone with Nate. And as that happened, it's almost like my brain started to uh, um, adjust to a new world that didn't have a minute. And then I could feel the stress go down. You know, today we live in a world where you probably have a billion videos on mm -hmm. your phone of you and Nate and the kids. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to make a decision about the frequency with which you would indulge in watching those versus putting a limit on it or saying, I'm going to put this in a box, right? I'm going to, I'm going to allow myself to do this for an hour a day, but I'm not for the other 23 hours. I'm going to do something else. I mean, did you hundred is such a great question. Cause I, we, we talk about that all the time in grief groups. It's, it's cutting. You get your iPhone out and you just let it fly. Um, a lot of what I've started to do recently. And I, I started early on in some of the practices from the Buddhist or is setting a time to feel my emotions were so big for so long. And I still work on that. Like being aware that my emotion is not me, but it's just coming through me. But I actually get to close the door if I want and I can open it when I want. That has been a practice that's changed my life the past two years, which is, okay, Kelsey, do you want to right now um, feel really sad and really kind of get your eyes swelled up and put on some like Chicago and just like really go through some videos? 
okay, I'm going to give you seven minutes to do that. And then we're seven. I know. Well, wow. well, because for a while, like my girlfriend would call at night and I would just be like, it's been hours. It's been hours. I'm just going, and you know, and I'd forward them to people and I just would want feedback. Like you mm. remember this, you remember this. And it, I, I would imagine your friends might not even know what to do it's the worst. because they'd be like, wow, I don't want to deny that this happened. I don't want to mm-hmm. deny that this is special, but I also don't want to keep her head down yeah. and let her drown. And they even get tired. People that are supporting grieving people get tired of being there and being like, I know you miss them. I know. So there's a dance of saying like, and your good friends will be like enough. Like, I think that's good. Like we've, we've been down that road for about an hour now. Um, and even now, like, I feel like I know sort of how to help people that are grieving cause I felt it, but I still, it's still a very tricky thing. Um, I don't know how I feel about the videos. I'm so grateful I have them. My kids don't look at pictures. They don't like it. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, how did the kids participate in that? Kids are a great thing to have, and they're exhausting to have during grief. When you have kids and you're going through grief, they keep you going in a regular life. And at the same time, you can't really grieve until they're gone, and they do not like to see you sad. But I, I talked to a ton of people um, who had lost parents when they were younger, and I remember all of them were like, just please don't, if, if, if only my mom had been okay, it would have been great. But we lost my dad and then we lost my mom too because she never got happy again. So I remembered that. And in the beginning, I also felt like, well, my kids need to see that I'm really sad and show them how to grieve because there's that movement too. But what I realized, it's a very fine line. Kids do not like to see their parents sobbing. It scares them. So if I'm in a, if I'm over in the corner shaking and crying and be like, I miss your father, it's not, it doesn't feel safe for a nine and 12 year old. Do you think that kids are innately wired to move on from this quicker? 100%. My kids are exceptional. And in talking to other parents who have lost a spouse, do do you think that's true? Not just for your kids, but in general, do you think that's true for kids that they are in that sense more wired to move on? Because they live in the present moment. They haven't played out a whole future. They don't know that they missed the wedding. They don't know that he missed their graduation because they've never had graduation. That's all in our heads. I think that if you, and this is just what's worked for me, if you create a home that is joyful and the person, and the trauma is allowed to be spoken about when they want, and that there is, that it's not something bad that happened. It's something that is we experienced and we get to, to decide how we want to tell the story. I think kids can survive amazing things much better than adults because they don't have preconceived ideas. So yeah, I think kids are, I think kids live in the moment too. And if you're lucky enough, I hit it right at the right age because kids become so self-consumed around 12 that their whole world becomes their friends. And so once my kids kicked into that, parents are kind of in the background. Like you're there, but you're in the background of their lives. And Nate's alive in our house very much so. So it's not something they have- I mean, we talk about them all the time. We do you still have pictures. We have some. I took down a lot because I realized to. Um, it goes back to the videos. You don't want to be. You want to be careful with grief and pictures and videos that you let it in when it's the appropriate time, because if not, it can it can become all consuming. So we definitely have a a poster board of pictures, but all the pictures in our house now mostly are of the kids and I. Hmm. And there's some of Nate, but it's not like, and we have an area where we have a Super Bowl and we have a picture of the family. Where's his ring? His ring is in the bank, like the, what's it called? It's a deposit box? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to wear it around a necklace no, I don't want it like a like nose that. ring or something. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, yeah, I think talking about it to my kids, he's, we talk about him all the time. I'm like, your dad would say, and they get really pissed if I'm like, your dad would be let down. And they're like, you don't know that, so don't say it. You don't get to pull that card. I was like, I was just trying to get you. <laughs> um, we laugh a lot about the way Nate died. Say more about that. I mean, who dies at Sky Zone during toddler time wearing orange sticky socks? I mean, that's just ridiculous. Like, you couldn't make that up. I think he's the first person to ever die. I know I'm not supposed to say Sky Zone for legal reasons or whatever, but that's what I would, I mean, who does that? Like, he's the first person in history to jump, jump, die at, during, during toddler time playing basketball with his kids. It's just, it's so bad, it's good, at least for a comic. And for me, and then I, I think in the story I talk a lot, he died on 11, 11 at 11, which again, I just was like, thanks, buddy. Like, there's just a thousand nods to me. It feels like that we're okay and that this thing's bigger than we think and that 
Don't get your panties in a bunch. Like this is just death. Um, it happens all the time. I think that's the other thing. The kids now, we are, we've are we been to enough grief things and enough grief camps that we, we think it, we're like, people are dying all the time. Nobody else knows it, but it is unbelievable how many people are dying every day. So there's a acceptance of death in our house that is probably very different than in other houses. So how long after Nate died, did you have your first psychedelic experience? So about nine months after. And what was the lead up to that like? How did you think about going through that and what what were you afraid of? What were you hoping to get out of it? So I had gone to this um, event in Estonia and uh, the summer after Nate died and a bunch of people were talking about psychedelics and I, for grief work and a lot of trauma work. And I had, I, I really didn't have any, I, I got to a point where I was doing better, but I, I needed to access Nate. Like I had this de- deep desire to have a relationship with him and raise the kids with him, even if he wasn't in this realm. And I remember I was having a conversation and I was like, I just need to get to him. Cause I know, I believe that like the body went away, but I don't, I don't know where he is. And I, I can talk to God. I feel great with my relationship with God. Um, I just don't know how to get to him, but I, I need to get to him. Cause I was kind of starting to go crazy. And this one guy was like, have you ever done mushrooms? And I was like, no, but my brother did a lot in high school and I would never, and I don't like druggies. And I think you guys are a bunch, I'm very uptight and I <laughs> have two glasses of wine and I'm not fun and don't even ask. And, <laughs> and I'm going to keep judging and you. I'm, and I'm going to judge you because that's what I do best. And I'm going to keep doing that because look where it got me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then they were like, have you ever tried MDMA? And I was like, this is all this is all ridiculousness because you guys are all exactly the kids I did not want to hang out with in high school. Because my experience was my brother's an addict, my brother-in-law's an addict, um, Oxycontin and alcohol. He's 14 years sober. And then my my brother was just a partier. He followed fish and the dead. And I just remember him being like gonzo, a lot of high school. And so at some point I was talking to this, this guy who'd done so many psychedelics. I mean, literally the guy was crazy. He was like telling me about having sex in a thorn bush. And I was like, why am I even talking to this weirdo? But I said, you know, I'm just not going to do, I'm never going to try that stuff. And he said, why? I said, well, I'm afraid. I'm not, I don't want to die. Like my kids just lost their dad. I'm not going to, they're not going to, I'm not going to jump off of a, a bridge after doing too many mushrooms. And he's like, but you're already dead because you're so afraid of everything. And I was like, oof. So I talked to a couple of our friends and I said, listen, I'll be ready when I'm ready. And I mean, there's this, there's this saying in that community that says the plants, you'll, the plants will welcome you or you'll, you'll know, like, it's not something you can force somebody to do. You'll know when it's time. And I got a call in October and of after he had died, so almost a year. And they said, we're going to do this group with these shamans. Are, are you interested? And I remember it was very clear. I could just hear it. I was like, I'm in. And I would had probably a level 10 anxiety going into it because I had never done anything. I mean, I wasn't even a drinker really, just always been an old fashioned, uptight, fear-based, neurotic person, you know, just classic. And we get to this house and well, beforehand the shamans called and just kind of asked me what, what I wanted to work through. And I said, you know, I have these couple of events that were very traumatic, the morgue, the corners, telling my children. Um, I couldn't remember anything from the time I'd gotten the call um, until I landed, until after the plant journey. So I had pretty much- That I, whole story about getting on the airplane and the woman helping you. I didn't know where I, I, don't, I still can't remember where the layover was, but I, I couldn't remember a lot of that flight. Mm-hmm. And so I knew there was some trauma there that had been blocked out. And I thought, well, I better be able to access that. So, so she listened to it all. And then we got together. It was this beautiful group. We talked about intention. We talked about um, you know, what we hoped to get out of it everything opposite of what I thought it would be, which was just like everyone popping pills and, you know, dancing to rave music and, um, just a good group of people. I could just loving people, supportive. And I kind of shared what I was, where I was at. And I mean, it's kind of a funny story. So the first thing they gave me was, uh, well, they gave me something and I took it and I had a full blown panic attack and I raised my hand and I was like, so I told you it's not working. Like I want it out. And she came over and was like, we gave you a placebo because we knew that you like this, this was <laughs> <laughs> the first hump was going to be a big one for you. And she did it's kind of similar to what the woman on the plane did. She put her hand on my head and I laid down and she actually breathed me through my panic attack. And she said, that wasn't anything. Now this is it. And she said, um, 
just let it do its work. And did you start with psilocybin or MDMA? I don't, I, I, I think I started with, I don't know. They won't tell me okay. the exact, they wouldn't tell me exactly what and what and where, but what I do know is I dropped Oh, I remember we were all laying in a circle and everybody by then was kind of laying down and everyone, someone said, have you dropped in? And I was like, what, what does it drop in? Like, I don't know. What does it mean to drop in? And someone so you're was like, that annoying person. That's like, <laughs> I was the worst. No. And our friend, which, you know, but I will we'll yeah. name nameless, but he was like, Jesus Christ. Like, can we get this girl? Can you give her more? <laughs> um, but I was like, when are we going to drop in everybody? <laughs> Is anybody else dropped in? And somebody was like, you'll know when you drop in. <laughs> And I remember like three minutes later, I was like, I'm in. Like, <laughs> it was just so ridiculous. Um, it was just so embarrassing. And he was like, oh God, here we go. Babysit her all night. Um, but within like three minutes, I was back on the plane. Mm. And I was, but this that time, yeah, I was back on the plane right then. And I started to cry and I started to I was loud. I mean, my friend will tell me I was loud. Our friends were like, you were loud the whole time. Um, but all of a sudden, everybody in the journey space kind of came and sat next to me and we kind of did the flight together. Mm. And so I felt supported. And so I cried and cried. And I said, this is so scary. He's dead. You know, I went through the whole thing and they were like, we're right here with you. You're not alone. We're right here. You're safe. Look how strong you are. You're going to your babies. And it felt like six hours from what I know now that you know, I've, we've talked about it. It was probably like five or six minutes. I did the whole flight again, but with support. And it was like that first thing was over. And I had peace about it. I remembered the whole thing. I remembered what seat I was in. I remembered, you know, transferring planes, all that stuff. And then I got up, I got some water and I was like, oh my God, I'm not, I thought I was going to be like drunk and crazy. I was just regular again. I woke up I got up, I had, I talked to some people, I talked to the shamans and I remember they were like, would you like, to, are you going to go in again? And I said, yes. And all I did was lay down again. And this, this whole process was insane to me that it was, I could modulate my experience safely by my intention and whether I close my eyes or not. I mean, I was like, this is not what I thought. So then I revisited the morgue and I was really angry. I had a ton of anger that he'd left me that I had never accessed. I mean, rage, like you fucking left me. At 40, you promised you wouldn't. You're a liar. You left me with a nine and 12 year old. You bastard. I told you to lose weight. And I was furious. I mean, I remember just a rage I had never felt. And you had never really gone through that stage never. of grief. Never. In the previous year. Never been angry at him. I just felt sad for him, scared for him. Where is he? Hope he's okay. I was terribly worried about my dead husband. And everyone's like, he's good. Focus <laughs> on the people that are alive. And at that moment, I had all the anger I'd ever had for him for 20 years, but mostly for leaving me, because he had promised he wouldn't, um, furious to the point where my friend was like, when you're done with it, which I think we're good. Like, you've, like we got it. And you're also disrupting the whole group. Um, Did they take you to another? So he took me up and then one of the facilitators came with me and I said, would you mind? Oh, because my friend had said, why don't you go find Nate? Like you've done the work, you've gone through a bunch of things. We're hours in at this point. He said, go, go find Nate, see what he has to tell you because you, you wanted to find him. And Peter, no shit. I went up there, I laid down and one of the facilitators came in. I said, can you just remember whatever I say? Cause I think it's going to be good. And I need you to write it all down. And fast forward at the, in a, the next day at the integration, he's like, it was too beautiful. I couldn't remember anything. I just sat there and listened. I'm like, oh my God. But I remembered most. So I laid down on the couch up by myself and I called for Nate and I promise you he was just in front of my face. And I know everybody's listening to this. If you know me, you think this is insane, but this is exactly my experience. Nate was right there. He's like, I've never left. And I said, but where did you go? He's like, I'm still here. I just... Um, my body wasn't serving me anymore. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, look at this. And he just took his whole body and just like threw it on the ground like it was clothes. And he's like, I'm right here. And the first thing he did was he showed me my kids. And he said, we all chose this. They were born for this. And he, the kids were kind of on a mountain, um, like Game of Thrones. And he's like, they called for this. We all agreed to this. They're stronger than you think. Um, and then he gave me some like, tips like he would have if he was here about how to kind of raise them and what they needed from me. And he's like, you need to slow down with Addison or you need to um, just spend time one-on-one -on -one with Jack, like only things he would know. 
And then he said, the biggest thing is you've got to live fearlessly. And he said, I'm going to show you what it feels like. And then we flew like around the universe. (laughs) And it was probably the first time in my life I felt um, free. And he's like, there's, it's, it's all okay. We're all okay. And you have a choice right now to just have the best life and I want you to go live it. And I'm, I'm right here. You can access me at any time. Just call for me. And we, from that point on, um, we have a great relationship and I, I feel him. He sends me songs and birds and hummingbirds. And if I pay attention, he's everywhere. And I, totally i don't know where you go or what happens but i am very clear that if we're made of energy and if i can talk to god why wouldn't i be able to talk to nate and so now it's this kind of um i mean i like i said it's just like it's even better than our marriage because i talk all the time he just listens even more and he doesn't even he and then he just tells me things in very quick um two or three words like you're fine yes slow down Stop talking. That's a lot of stop talking. Did you ask him anything in particular that you had never asked him before in that journey there? I asked him, why did you play football? And he said, because it was the easiest way for people to respect me and listen to me so I could share with them about love. He said, I never really loved playing football, but I love that it gave me um, access to people so I could talk to them about the stuff I really wanted to talk about, which was never about football. (laughs) He didn't talk much about football when he was done. He hated it. He hated to talk about it. Did he still watch it? Yeah. He loved, because he loved to put some money on the game and be with his buddies and just scream at a TV and have fun. Um, He just, he was like, Kelsey, this is, this, this is what you've been waiting for. This is what you've, you knew this was coming. You knew this was coming. You're fine. This was, my time's over. Like this was, I did my part. Don't, don't, um, don't worry about me. He's like, it's exceptional where I am. Okay, it was just, it was beautiful. And I, I mean, I, it would, I, I mean, maybe it's the top, one of the top three experiences of my life. Probably. It's certainly something that most people who've experienced it would, would say. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I, I also, and we talked about this, but Xanax and Ambien and the things they give you for grief work just put you, black you out and you have no idea what happened. Or I used to wake up and be like, why is everyone sad? <laughs> like, you know, and what, what the mushrooms and the whole plant experience gave me was an ability to go towards it and understand it and, and walk through it and come out of it being like, okay, like we're all okay. And for me, I think I, I probably was most afraid of death. Most of us are, but that was the biggest fear of my life is I didn't want anybody I love to die and I didn't want to die. And now, of course, I'm not like looking forward to it, but I have great peace that this is so much bigger and I've seen it and I've felt it. And so, I don't know, people get tired because I'm so fired up about plant medicine now from someone who's like, you know, I've probably done five or six since then. Nothing quite as mind blowing as that yeah, first one. What, what have the subsequent trips been like? Do you go into them with a, a much more um, focused uh, intention? I've done both. I've gone in with a focused intention, like I'm looking for some answers. And I've also gone in being like, just tell me what is, for me, it feels like a download of information of, um, it feels like a connection that is so much bigger than anything I could have just in my day to day. The biggest thing about plants, this, this is important. I, I really need a lot of approval and I've spent my life trying to be great at everything and have people give me girls and when I did that first experience and it's been subsequent in all my experiences is my ego completely goes away and I don't, I'm the biggest judgment. I'm a comic. I try to make fun of everybody. I like use everything against people. (laughs) And when I'm in those experiences, I have no judgments on anybody and I have no desire to be liked. And no judgments on yourself. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, there's this like, it's this 10 or 11 hours where I'm not worried about what people think of me or what I think of them, which it's such a relief, you know? So for me, that's probably, that's the biggest thing I get out of those experiences is this, what would it look like if my ego just got out of the way and I just was present with what is and with what who is, and you just see good. And I didn't ever feel like messed up. I mean, I literally tell my friends who are still so against it, you're, I, none of it was scary. 
And obviously I haven't done any ayahuasca and I, I'm not called to that at all right now, currently in my life. Um, but man, it's a lot better than getting drunk and crying. You know, I stopped drinking pretty, pretty soon after he died because I drink tequila and just sob. And so I'm real clear now that alcohol is a depressant. Even to this day? Yeah. I, I drink red wine now, but I, any type of alcohol cues anxiety because the sugar makes my heart race. And then if I can't sleep, then it get then once this thing starts, my brain starts going, it can be not a safe place. So alcohol just doesn't really work for me anymore. Did you talk with your kids after the psilocybin experience? And tell them about it? Yeah. No, I haven't yet. Uh, you meaning as of yet? As of yet, So yeah. they might watch this and... Yeah, they might. Or actually, I, I had some notes when I had... I left some notes at home and I was like, Jack, can you take a picture of these notes? And I was like, oh shit. Well, there you go. <laughs> You're gonna... If he read it. Um, he's just now... He's 16 now. So he would understand it. But they are both... They hate drunk people. They hate my, my brother-in-law is actually, I mean, obviously sober. So there's been a connotation around drugs in our family that it's, it's really not good. Um, so this will have to be a longer discussion and I don't really know. I mean, I don't, what do you think? When do you talk to your kids about it? Have you talked to your 13 year old? No, not about psychedelics. Yeah, um, me neither. But, um, I, actually that's not true. I've talked about it once with her uh, through the lens of drugs Okay. and um, sort of trying to explain that, um, you know, um, d the legality of a drug is a second order consideration. I mean, it's an important consideration, obviously, if you're trying to abide by the law, but the, the, you want to think about this first through the lens of the molecule. Yep. And, and I've shared with her this framework that I've borrowed from somebody else that I think is very valuable, right? Which is, um, cause I talk about this all the time with patients, right? So, you know, one, one of the questions you ask a patient, during an intake with them is, you know, tell me how many drinks you have in an average right. week. Tell me which recreational drugs you use. Um, and this is not a judgmental discussion, but it's, you really want to understand this. And look, a lot of times people say, yep, I use Coke once a month. I do this, I do that, I do this, one of that. And so the, the thing I discussed with them, and this is what, sort of what I explained to Olivia once was, you know, there are certain drugs, alcohol being a drug as well, where they change your state. I love, I've heard this podcast yeah, you did. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. this but they don't change traits. And then there are others that change your state. And if you use them correctly, they can change your traits. Yep. And so I said, and by the way, there are legal and illegal molecules in both of those camps. Mm -hmm. And that's worth noting and respecting, but really the things in this camp, you have to really ask yourself, how often am I doing this and why am I doing this? And so, you know, I put cocaine very clearly in this camp, right? right? It clearly changes your state and I've never done cocaine, but the people I talk to who love it tell me how great they feel when they do it, but they can't make a compelling case for me that it makes them better when they're not on cocaine. 100%. Um, and the same is true for alcohol in reality. So, so one, you know, you have to be careful about the use of those things. And obviously the things we're talking about, psilocybin and MDMA, at least have the potential if done correctly to make you a better version of you long after that medicine is gone. Yeah. I remember you, I listened to that podcast of yours and I... That's exactly it. Like I am a different person because of those experiences and I'm, I'm better. And the only reason I know that is because I, I'm more, um, I'm less afraid. I'm more patient. I think I have less answers. I'm more open. I mean, all the things that you, you hope to get in therapy, but it's very hard to get your brain to change. And I feel like, tell me from a physician standpoint, it opens up a pathway that was like blocked, like it had a blockade. And you, you, it was always there. You just hadn't gone down it. And so when I took psilocybin, it, it like moved that blockade. And there, there was a road I never knew that was just ease and love and fearlessness. And after I was done, I started to walk down that road more often in my day-to-day -day life because for so long, it wasn't even accessible to me. And now it's a road that I choose quite often. Um, and same thing with MDMA. For me, I've done that very rarely, but it, it's shown me fun how to just be connected and, and not, again, not judging and just, um, and if mom and you're listening, I know you guys had no idea. I was so edgy, but it gave me, so now, even if I don't do it, I remember the feeling I can access that, that, that neural pathway and I can go, oh, Kelsey, you know what it feels like to be at a, a party and be calm and not worrying about getting home and worried about the Uber and, and just like be here. And I can almost get myself to that new road that I, 
always had, but it just always had a huge blockade in front of it. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think, I think those are two good examples of how those molecules work. And I mean, I think MDMA really has this ability to, you know, so create this empathy that is yes. very difficult for most people to access, um, on command. Uh, or, or frankly, not under the influence of that medication. And that's, to me, if you, if you can craft the intention around that, it's, um, you know, it can really do an amazing thing for a relationship as well yeah. with yourself, but also with somebody else, especially if there has been something that's gone really wrong. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's probably been, there's been a ton of gifts of grief and I talk about them all the time, but I think that, that those experiences have been and everyone hates me for it because once I get excited about something, I get really excited. So I came out of the, I came just blazing hot on uh, plant journeys. And now I kind of understand that you have to be ready and have to want it and have to be ready to be open to it. But I am. And the other thing I, I, I do think that, um, at least in my limited experience, um, I think that the best of both worlds is when you combine that work with the traditional work of therapy. Completely. And I do think that if there's one thing about the, the new appreciation people have of psychedelics that I think is dangerous, it's that people believe that the plant or the molecule by itself can do all the work. Like all I have to do is do psilocybin once a month or once a quarter and, and it's all good. And it's like, no, those are incredible lubricants to allow you to do very difficult things when you're long off the influence of those medications. So I, I also think like, uh, again, it's impossible to say what fraction of your recovery has been predicated on that experience versus all that came before it and after right. it and around it. Um, so that's kind of the one thing that I, I tend to remind people of. That's smart because you know. I've done a ton of work. I've, done, I've read a bunch. And I, I think the other big thing that I do that has supported all of that is just I have a, I'm militant about meditation. Militant. And were you before? I had started on the path, but maybe 20 minutes a day here and there, maybe insight timer. Um, once Nate died, it became a must. And to this day, and I, I saw you guys just got the sauna bag, but I will sit in with Dispensa. I think Dispensa probably, Dispensa's work has probably changed my life the most in terms of a daily practice. So changing a thought or watching a thought or, um, knowing that my feelings are transient and that I can change a feeling through it, changing a thought, or I can say change, or I can say stop. And, um, it doesn't mean they're not going to come, but I do have some agency in how I feel and what I feel, which I never believed before. Um, so I think if you, if you, like you said, if you do the, the psychedelics in conjunction with a very deep meditation and, you know, a committed spiritual practice that gives you peace, whatever that might be, you you have a great shot at coming out of pretty much everything. Yeah, it's I, I've always found it sad, I guess. And I, I, I'm only saying something that I'm sure a billion other people have thought or said. <laughs> um, but it's remarkable that this isn't taught alongside English, science, math, to kids coming up in school. Like you, you can play the thought experiment of what if from the moment kids entered kindergarten, we had an emotional health class as well that was part of the core curriculum where you learned to distance yourself from your thoughts. And right. like, and you know, we're gonna spend 30 minutes a day on this course throughout, you know, K to 12. Yeah. Um, how many different habits could we develop and yeah. how could we equip ourselves? Um, you mentioned something in your book that resonates deeply with me, which is radical acceptance. Mm. When did you first encounter that term? Um, Tara Brock. Mm -hmm. I probably read it. My mom was into this stuff for a long time. So this was always in the background noise of my life. My dad left when I was 15 and my mom really went on this like journey. So these books and these people, were part of it, but I, the idea of radical acceptance that, that, that something wasn't good or bad probably happened. I mean, after Nate died, I mean, I don't think, I think I knew of it in practice, but when everything's good, seems good, it's hard to, you're like, oh yeah, good luck to those people that, you know, have a sick kid or whatever. I hope they just accept what is. Um, 
And I always thought that before I really experienced it, that it is what it is was an annoying statement. <laughs> and it was kind of just like a throwaway, like, oh, well, it is it. Life's shit. So just accept it. And now I'm like, no, it's beautiful. It is what it is. How wonderful is that? Like, can, can you just be with whatever without, it doesn't mean it won't feel hard. It doesn't mean it's not miserable. It just means it is exactly what you are going through. And the resistance to that and the wishing it was different is what kills you. So a lot of people say, how are you doing so well? And I say, because I don't wish it was different. That's pretty much it. Do you think your kids understand that? I don't know. I don't, they're still, they were so young and they, you know, I'm, I'm really working on understanding that they have their own path to this and their own journey. And we all have different relationships to Nate and different stories that we tell in our head. I would say they are surprised at how great life is compared to what they thought it would be when he first died. Sometimes they'll say, I mean, isn't it great? We're so happy again. Mm. Isn't it great that we're, we have fun again? Um, look, look at how, look at how good our life is. And so that's their way of saying like, we made it in some way. We, we accepted what is, and we continue to build a life that was beautiful. We talk a lot in our house about what would Nate want us to do. And Nate would want us to be joyful. So if you want to honor your dead person, the best way to do it is live the life they would want you to live if they were here. So in that sense, the kids, you know, we can't even take it out anymore. He's gone. And so our life is this and, um, we miss him and we're happy and we accept it and we miss him. But yeah, radical acceptance, I think it gets easier the more you do it. So I, and I mean, little things, you know, you practice at the stoplight, you're like, and the light isn't moving and it's all the things we've all read, but until you have to practice it, cause you're in such a dark spot. Um, I don't know that you, you can, and people always say like, oh, can you transform without going through something big? I don't know if you can, I don't know. Cause I, I had a, I, I read it all and I intellectually knew it all, but until I had to really dig into those practices, it didn't, it, I was glad I, I would say prepare with them, but until you get to that point, there is magic in that transformation when you do the work. Um, but I don't know. What are your thoughts? You think you have to go through hard things? I don't think I'm equipped to answer the way you are. Yeah. I suspect so, but. I mean, I, I was hoping not. Or at least a near miss. You know, I, I have a good friend, Rick Elias, who was actually on the podcast and um, he was on that United Der you, you know, uh, U.S. air flight that uh, was going to crash and somehow made the miraculous landing in the right. Hudson River in 2009. And so in that sense, you know, nothing bad happened to him, but there was a two minute period where he really thought, no, 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 this is it. I am dead. He went through all of that. And Rick is a, you know, that was 13 years ago this month. And Rick is still living the life of the guy who was given a second chance. I agree. So, you know, could Rick have come to this same set of principles that guide his life today without that? I just don't know. My know. guess is there's maybe somebody that could. I don't know that I could. Yeah, it's it's just interesting. And I there's just a real relief when you stop wishing it was different. Whatever it is. When you stop wishing whatever you're going through wasn't, and you just go like, let's roll. Like what, what I, what I, what I've got to learn, what's on the other side of this? Um, what will it feel like when it's transformed into something different? What can I get excited about? It's, I just, I think that the, the practices work. That's what I believe now. I believe that you can get through things and I've, I've got a lot of easy, easy ways because my situation is fairly easy. If you look at it, the way we can spin some of it, it's better that he's not here I was left with resources. I always think too about grief. Like if a woman has resources, it's a very different experience than if you don't. So, you know, um, there's a thousand things that interact to make your experience what it is, but internally, the Stoics and the, and the Buddhists and believing in something bigger than you, those are kind of key pillars, at least for me. What would you say to a man or woman or a child listening to this right now who's three months out from that tragedy based on everything you've learned to start just hang on just hang on for now um i think i think i said humans are, are built to last we're meant to we're we're built to make it through things um and and do the work 
whatever that work is for you, whatever, wherever you're trying to go do the work and the work will eventually support you. Um, you know, you get like, I think of it, if you're over here and you're trying to get over here and there's a, there's, you got to build a bridge. If you, once you build the bridge, you'll get over there, but you got to go to work. Um, the bridge isn't there yet. And that's where the meditation and the reading and the gratitude and the changing your brain, that's, those are each plank that you're building to get over to the other side. And if you do the work, you're going to look back and be like, damn, like I never thought I could build that bridge. And you're going to be more confident and more joyful because you just saw you did something you never thought you could do. So life just got sweeter. How hard was it to write the book? You know, I didn't have any pressure around it. And I know, I think you're writing a book. Um, I didn't have any pressure on it because it was just... Not, not why I asked, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, but I, I remember um, Jill talking about that you were writing one. For me, I had to get the story out. It was very personal because I wanted my kids to remember. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to remember because I knew I was going to love again. And I knew I was going to date. And I knew I was going to have other relationships. And time is a miracle when it comes to life. Because as time goes on, the pain just, it does gradually get better. And so I thought, I better make sure that the, the story of this great man is down. So that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren will know where they came from and who he was and how this all happened. Somewhere in the middle, you think, this is such shit that I, I was embarrassing to like, I, I shouldn't even show it to the, my worst enemy because this is just blabber of nothing. And I'm so bored with what I wrote. It's so dumb and it's so ridiculous that, I mean, just stop now because this is torture for you and nobody's, this is horrible. And then you get to a point where you've written enough and then it gets to an editor and they make it a little better and they give you some feedback and you just start cutting stuff out. And that's kind of, then it got fun because I was like, just cut out all the junk that you tried to make and just tell it like it is and don't worry about what people think. And I'm so glad I did it. I can't imagine doing it again. And I know I want to, but I don't even know where you start. It, it feels surreal now. You forget. You forget sitting there looking at your computer being like this, possibly the boringest paragraph I've ever written. We're like, I just like you just, it's a unique experience writing a book because the internal, um, dialogue and anxiety and just disgust with what you're putting out is really epic just because you're just you're you're reading what you already hated that you wrote and it's just double flogging you know um but i i would tell people write it down because man it it helps somebody like somebody is is going to be helped by it or get inspired by it and just go easy on yourself with a book what's the most surprising thing that you've received as a, as a way of feedback? God, there's, there's been so many people that have written that have said, thank you for showing, um, thank you for being honest. And I think what that means is the good and the bad, like not trying to play grief either way, like that there is a duality to everything in life. And people are like, thank you for letting us know that it was awful and you felt like you were on fire and you couldn't wait to have sex with other people. Like, Thank you for knowing that like, you know that you lost the man of your dreams and you also get to meet other people and have a new experience. And that's gonna, that's, that might be exactly what was meant to be. This sense that everything isn't good or bad either way. So there's a whole life I'm gonna have that I never even knew possible. And there was one that I really loved that got taken away. So people say like, thank you for giving it a multifaceted approach to this experience I'm having. Did your kids read it before you published it? No. Have they read it now? No, they don't want to either. Mm. They are terribly embarrassed by it and secretly proud. They don't want it out. And then Jack's like, uh, mom, I'm taking your book to the, my school counselor. Cause well, she asked what your job was and I didn't know what to tell her. I said, she's, she wrote a book and I was like, so he, they're proud of it, but they're also way more private than me. I'm the least private person on the planet. So I'm learning to understand that they'll tell it in their time. And they'll read it in their time. And they'll I read suspect. it in their time. And their experience will be very different from what I wrote. I'm fairly certain that they'll read chapters and go, that's not how it went. Like, I didn't do that. I didn't say that. Um, but we'll see. I don't know. I don't know how they'll be. Well, Kelsey, I, um, I, I can't thank you enough. You know, um, this is just such a beautiful story. And, Thanks. Um, I, I think people are going to be infinitely enriched, um, whether they've experienced something like this or whether they will, um, because I think, you know, we all will. 
Yeah. Might not be as sudden. It might not be as tragic with a capital T, but um, the human experience is one of loss. So um, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you so much for having me. It really means a lot to me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Drive. If you're interested in diving deeper into any topics we discuss, we've created a membership program that allows us to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. It's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Now, to that end, membership benefits include a bunch of things. One, totally kick-ass comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, thing we discuss on each episode. The word on the street is nobody's show notes rival these. Monthly AMA episodes or Ask Me Anything episodes, hearing these episodes completely. Access to our private podcast feed that allows you to hear everything without having to listen to spiels like this. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast that we release every Tuesday through Friday, highlighting the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and necessarily listen to everyone. Steep discounts on products that I believe in, but for which I'm not getting paid to endorse and a whole bunch of other benefits that we continue to trickle in as time goes on. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. 